Thank you very much for uh, opening in prayer. It is the uh, usual uh, practice of the IFP for many, 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 many decades that whenever we have a function, formal function, we always start with a prayer, uh, not a silent prayer, because we don't know about silent prayers. We, we start with a prayer prayer. So thank you, Pastor Ruben, and uh, once again, welcome to all of you, particularly our guests, uh, Professor Mike Muller and uh, Mr. Ashley Starkey. Thank you very much for agreeing to be with us this morning. And uh, thank you to Mr. Christian Andres from the Conrad Adenauer Stifting uh, for not only being here, but for the Conrad Adenauer Stifting being partners with us in many ventures over the years, over the last 30 years or more, I think. And they've also partnered us in this particular exercise that we've been conducting uh, yesterday and today. Yesterday, we had a very, very well, on the day before, we went on an outreach. We went to the Morocco police station and we met senior officials from the police. We met people who used the services of the police. And uh, then we went to Home Affairs and, uh, and uh, a Tusong Center there. But can I announce the date, Honorable Fonamerva? Right. Uh, is it the 20? Okay. Yeah, colleagues, those of you who are MPs uh, with us from caucus and the accounting legislators, uh, the Director General of Home Affairs, uh, because of the foul power, the buildings were closed when we went there on, on Thursday uh, due to water problems here in... <laughs> water problems here, <laughs> uh, Professor and Mr. Slucky. <laughs> Government buildings were closed, and uh, so was the uh, Hector Peterson Museum. Uh, closed, we had paid, we went there, they said, sorry, no water, home affairs, welfare, all closed, no water. Well, Joburg has got a particular problem, so, so the Director General of Home Affairs has agreed that uh, we come through again on the 7th and 8th of August, from the evening of the 7th and the whole of the 8th of August, and he is going to personally, uh, Honorable Fonamerva, take us through uh, the head office, uh, show us the uh, successes that they are having as home affairs and also the challenges that they are facing in many areas. Because as we know, uh, the services at home affairs leaves a lot to be desired in many instances. People queue from 4 o'clock in the morning and then at 2 o'clock in the afternoon they tell you, sorry, you're, you know, you're, the numbers have been done, uh, you must come back tomorrow and it, it's, a, it's a perennial thing. Then you go there, it's offline, uh, and then and you don't get your passport, you don't get your visa, you don't get your death certificate, whatever. So I think it's very, very important that we conduct that oversight. Uh, so just uh, diarize those dates, and Mr. President, you are welcome to join us as well, if, if, if you are available uh, on those dates. So uh, I also want to welcome our Deputy President, uh, Honorable uh, Botelezi, who is there on, on, on the right. He had to fly back to Durban for an emergency yesterday, but he's back. Thank you, Shanga, for being back today. Uh, Honorable Hatebe is here, Honorable Zondo is here, uh, Honorable Damini is here, the Gauteng MPL and leader of Gauteng, Honorable Machozi, my Deputy Chief Whip, uh, Honorable Kabekulu, the uh, caucus chairperson and member of National Parliament, Well, you met President Labisa, Christian, and then our two guests. Am I missing out any? Oh, Honorable Sitole at the back, uh, who is also National Member of Parliament, and then Professor Msimang. Uh, who's also a national member of parliament. Uh, unfortunately, a few of them uh, were here, but they had to leave for funerals and, and, and other things that usually happen on a Saturday. Uh, just in terms of housekeeping again, uh, Honorable Machozi, I've usurped your responsibility. Okay. Uh, uh, in, in, in terms of housekeeping, the restrooms are as you go out on the left. We will have a tea break, we will have a lunch break, and uh, the program is as, as it is here. But after 3 o'clock, we are going to have an in-house uh, program uh, where we're going to, the president is going to address us of the party, and we're going to deal with a few issues uh, until about 5 o'clock this afternoon. So, so having said that, it gives me great pleasure then to invite Mr. Christian Andres uh, from the Conrad Adenauer Stiftung who apologized for yesterday, uh, he had another commitment, uh, to make some remarks on this occasion. Christian, thank you.
Thank you, Honourable Singh. Good morning, everyone. Um, President Schlebisa, Honourable Members of National and Provincial Legislatures, Honoured Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen, on behalf of the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung, I'd like to extend a warm welcome, uh, if I may, and a, a big thank you to the Encarta Freedom Party for letting me speak this morning and inviting the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung to be here. Um, our strong relationship dates back to the early 80s, which is going past 30 years now. And we're really proud to have learned and walked and shared with the IFP as in, in the 80s the fight for democracy and I think now in the current effort to defend democracy. I don't think the process is done. So quickly, on behalf, uh, I'm here on behalf of my director and resident representative, Gregor Jecke, who is unfortunately not able to be here due to ill health. And he asks that I speak on his behalf. He does send his best wishes and he hopes that you have a stimulating debate and can take away a lot of learnings. I heard already that yesterday was an immensely productive session uh, with vigorous debate and many learnings. And these processes are so important because information gets shared throughout the party and we know what we need to take to our constituents and we have one message and clarity about what we are about. So these meetings are incredibly important and the fact that you're doing them in all the, the provinces or around the country uh, commends you. Quickly, a few words about the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung. We are a German political foundation named after Konrad Adenauer, who was the first chancellor of Germany after the war. So something like a president. And we are a think tank closely associated with the party that he founded, the Christian Democratic Union, which is also the party of former chancellor Angela Merkel, which might be a familiar name still. We promote democracy, good governance, human rights, and the rule of law. And so it might be evident why we are in South Africa, but also in more than 100 countries worldwide. And the big opportunity that we bring is that we can exchange information between the different countries. We can exchange learnings, we can generate networks that enrich all the different countries' democracy-promoting parties. Without our partners, that would not be possible. You know, if we just came into countries, we would have no one to speak to. We would have no one to speak to. Often the value happens between parties. So we really aim to contribute towards value-based, programmatically sound politics for the common good. And I'm sure that makes evident why we enjoy work working party, because those are certainly three things that we see here. Values, programs, and the working towards the common good. Now, I mentioned earlier that I think that we've gone from the fight for democracy towards defending democracy. So I'd quickly like to delve into that topic a little bit. Um, I, I personally believe that South Africa is not an established democracy, even though we've been here for 30 years. It's because of the decades of dominance of the ANC, which has hollowed out parliament, it's hollowed out the civil service, and it's now hollowed out the ANC itself. So all of these can be released. Uh, can be reversed, but the really challenging hollowing out is in democracy itself. At the last general election in 2019, only half of eligible voters actually voted. Many didn't even bother registering. The effect is that 10 million votes for the ANC, which is 27% of all eligible voters, gave the ANC 57% in Parliament. I mean, just, just think about that, right? We have a quarter of the voting population selected the ANC, and they got a dominant party ANC in, in government, which can decide what it likes to do. This despondency that is infecting our voting base is killing South Africa's democracy if we're not careful. And that frustration will cause people to call for a strong leader eventually who sorts things out. And strong leaders, strong rulers, tend to ignore democracy and they bring terror and bloodshed. So let's not go there. Who can turn it around? Well, it's the people in this room. It's democratically minded parties like the IFP. The pressure is in this room to get the non-voters out, 
to get the ANC out of power. The conference and caucus outreach uh, programs are excellent initiatives to allow the IFP to warm up, to stretch, to train for the big competition that is an election, much like if you were working towards a soccer game. It allows the party to find its feet, align its message, get down to grassroots membership, get clarity on why it is good, and why it is a servant to the people. A quick word on campaigning, if I may, because we're into the final stretch. It is considered an eternal truth in politics that parties are voted out, not parties voted in. The ruling party, its record of failure and weak politicians are the strongest argument to get out your own voters, the IFP voters. The ANC is not the party of Tambo or Mandela anymore. It is a and I wish you strength, strength to your arms, and I thank you for your time. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Andres, representing Konrad Adenauer Stiftung. And like he said, we've got a long relationship with them uh, in terms of uh, they provide training uh, for our youth, for our women, and I think uh, Honorable Lamini, who's going to be the moderator of the next session, was a beneficiary of, was it three months? Six months. Oh, God, six months. He was six months in, was in Berlin? Marburg. Marburg. Oh, Marburg University and uh, in? In Frankfurt. Right, so there were many of our young people that have gone to institutions in Germany and elsewhere, and there will be many more opportunities. In fact, uh, uh, Christian, yesterday, I must say, I was very, very, very impressed with the type of questions that were coming from our especially young people. And if I had to identify uh, some of them, I can just pick them out from where I'm standing here to say, arrange for them to go to Germany and let them be trained because they are going to be the leaders of the future. And I think my colleagues will agree with me, uh, Mr. President, that, you know, just, you know, the questions on the NHI and uh, its operation to senior people were really, really uh, very, very well done. So we've got young people here that can be sent to Germany tomorrow. And Mr. Andres, you'll arrange that uh, for the young people. And there were females uh, to boot, and there were some males as well. So Mbogoto is strong. Uh, okay. Yeah, the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung, I was in Maputo last week, uh, last week or the week before where another wing of the Conrad Adenauer arranged an, an environmental uh, conference, and I was asked to speak on the carbon border adjustment mechanism, which is a legislation that the EU wants to introduce, uh, you know, and, and, and actually put penalties on us, uh, many countries, if you bring certain products in, cement, fertilizer, and they've listed the products. If you bring them into the country, into the EU, then you'll have to pay additional uh, levies or uh, so you know it's going to be quite a problem we've got to deal with climate change and all our carbon issues here having said that uh, can i now ask uh, the honorable Nkwanyana, who is a member of the provincial legislature in kwazulu natal we decided to invite her to the summit uh, because we uh, she sits on the health portfolio committee and welfare and we felt we needed her to also be enriched from the debate that takes place. And by the way, to our panelists, uh, tomorrow we are going to Hamanskrau to look at the water issues there, <laughs> and maybe Mr. Starkey can talk to them, uh, and there'll be lots of people there in Hamanskrau. And also let me take this opportunity to welcome Dr. Turton. Uh, I don't know if you are online. He is from the Center of Environmental Management at the University of Free State. Uh, Dr. Turton, all of them will be introduced a little later by our moderator. So, Ma Nkwanyana. Thank you, Program Director, uh, Honorable Chief Whip of the Parliamentary in, 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 in Cape Town. Greetings to our President, Honorable V.F. Labisa. I'm so glad because we're all coming together from KZN. Now I'm feel free because my president is here. <laughs> <laughs> Greetings to Inko Sawatabekulu, 
who's here, Nkosi Yasembongongongweni, all the members who are here, greetings to you this morning. My name is Namsile Kwanyana. As Singh has said, I'm the member of the provincial legislature in KwaZulu Natal. I'm dealing with health, social development, as well as quality of life. I am so pleased and feel honored, Honorable Singh, to be invited in this summit, because to me it seems to be very crucial since we have been talking about NHI. But unfortunately, yesterday I was not well. I didn't hear everything what has been said, but I've got the report from my members that were here yesterday that everything went well. Yes, we've got some problems we all, with all these portfolio committees to where I'm sitting to. We've got a problem to health portfolio committee. We've got a problem to social development. As it is, day before yesterday, we visited Maponya Hall, where we find all the offices were closed due to water crisis. Now we're asking ourselves, if the, if the offices are closed, how are our people are going, going to get their service delivery? More especially those who are going to get debt certificates from home affairs. It was closed. Sasa offices were closed. Everything was closed in Maponya Hall. That's a challenge for all the members of the Gauteng who are here just to, to clear out the thing that it mustn't be happening again to our people. When we come to health, we have got problems in health. Since we have got NH, we are talking about NHI now, we as IFP, I thank you, Honorable Singh, that the other day when we've been having a briefing in case that about NHI, I phoned you asking about the stand of the IFP in this issue of NHI. Because we've got so many problems in health, in health department. They can talk about NHI as if it's going to help our people, yet, yet it's going to kill us. There are some problems, challenges and everything. We don't have infrastructure in KZN. They are falling down. We found our people waiting in long queues from morning till sunset, waiting for a panado only. From morning till sunset to wait for a panado, there is no treatment, there is nothing. We are running short of doctors, running short of nurses, but they are talking about NHI. How is it going to work? Because we, we still puzzle about the thing. We don't say our people mustn't get he help from the government, but they must think first how we are going to implement it. Because our people must be well know, must be on board about this thing. As it is now, Mr. Singh, next week, we as portfolio committees in, in KZN, we are going to run around the whole of KZN making public hearings how to tell people about this thing. We, I wonder how people are going to take it. But because ANC is insisted this thing to be done, they are going to do it. We, I know, we know, but it's going to kill our people. Today, I, I am I'm especially looking forward to this panel, as we have this provincial head of the Department of Water and Sanitation of KZN as part of our panel today. As you all know, the provinces of KZN and Gauteng is, is especially subjected to harsh conditions related to water challenges. Therefore, we welcome to, to, to this discussion of challenges and actionable solutions. So I'm very, very much happy to be in this summit. Maybe I'm going to gain more things, more knowledge of what are we going to do to, to render better service delivery to our people. I thank you, Mr. Singh. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Nkwanyana, for those uh, remarks and uh, observations this morning. Uh, Nkosi Butelezi has just issued uh, a fine on my cell phone for one Nkomo that I have to pay. And I think I'm going to ask all of you to help contribute for me to buy that. <laughs> because, you know, nowadays about 15,000 run. Uh, it's 15,000 rand for one. Uh, and, is, and, 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 and the reason for the fine is I omitted to introduce uh, our chief communications, our director of communications, 
our Member of Parliament on our Home Affairs Portfolio Committee, on Welfare Portfolio Committee, Honorable Van der Hi, Liz, how are you? <laughs> I mentioned the name so many times that I forgot to introduce her, so sorry about that. In course, I think you'll forgive me now. Uh, we can cancel the fine. Uh, I won't go back to jail, uh, even if the Concord said so. So, Nkosi, <laughs> please take that into consideration. No, thank you very, very much. Uh, right. Uh, uh, can I ask uh, Honorable Zamini, who is going to moderate this session, to please come up, and we'll just give uh, Professor Muller a second to join us. Uh, but also to say that, uh, uh, colleagues, on, on this year, for the young people, on, on your tags, oh, sorry, <laughs> on your tags here is a QR code. And if you download this QR code, it tells you everything about the IFP. Mission, vision, everything that we've done. So just on this QR code. And uh, so this is something that we've got for you. And now that we're here at Monte, which is free Wi-Fi, download it now. So <laughs> you don't have to use your, use your data. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to say, now that Professor is here, about the NHI is that the stand of the IFP we support universal health care. We realize that the millions of people do not get proper health care. While those of us who can afford it with medical aids, etc., we can access proper health care, but the other millions can't. But what we are objecting to is the fact that we cannot leave the administration and the governance of NHI solely in the hands of government and the minister. Because you know, if you look at the track record of this government in almost every department, the service delivery is, uh, you know, something that leaves a lot to be desired. So that is our concern as IFP, to strengthen the governance mechanisms towards making universal health care work for all of us in this country. We don't want millions and trillions to be collected and put into people's pockets. It must go into health services. So, 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 so that's what we... Uh, that's what we're about. So I'll hand over to our moderator of the session until about 12 o'clock or so. Uh, and uh, don't forget that we've got Dr. Jetton online. So please come up. Good morning. Dumelang. Likai. Absheni, konjek tuan ni tal sini ni madegu ane, oni macero ni. The program director, Honourable Singh, the chief whip of our party and the treasurer general of the AFP, the Honourable President and the leader of the official opposition and KZN, Honourable Sabisa, the deputy president and the Member of Parliament in Kosi, Telezi, the members of the National Caucus in Cape Town, the Youth Brigade National Chairperson, and there was a discussion about young people, TG, with you and the, SA and the Youth Brigade leader two nights ago, and I am happy that um, we have organized this and we have exposed young people to such things. I want to tell you young people that you are so privileged to be exposed to such exercises because that's where you grow as a leader. Is to be, even if I was not sure next year, but as long as we are absolutely. Because the aim is that, is to learn and grow. Uh, we were exposed to such uh, things to us as Chief Wipashilo. Uh, I was very lucky in 1996 to be taken to Germany for six months in Marbeck University in Frankfurt, where we were learning, but especially local government, but the IFP decided not to make me a council. Instead, after training for six months, <laughs> local government, and they take me to Cape Town. Um, thank you to our panelists. Uh, who are here, we are dealing with water. Uh, yesterday we were dealing with health. And I was puzzled yesterday, TG, when the, the, the doctor in the middle 
was so passionate about this NHI thing as if our infrastructure of health is it, it's ready for it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, I think he's, he was living in his own world. Uh, <laughs> Thank you very much, our panelists. Um, in, um, in 2022, the Eth Organization on Environment News and Data Platform reported that 25% to 30% of South Africa's water is being lost due to water leakage is caused by falling infrastructure. It is estimated that 70 million liters of treated clean and drinkable water are lost daily as a result of leak characterized South Africa's water piping. And manager for the Community Action Network has previously stated that the predominant cause for South Africa's water crisis can be attributed to factors such as aging infrastructure. It is undeniable that water infrastructure deterioration is also leading to people not having sufficient water. According to Greenpeace organization, approximately 19% of rural communities in South Africa need access to reliable, clean water. Ushilu, Dr. Ute, Eastern Cape, they don't have water. However, in our oversight visit on Thursday, the 13th of July, as IFP MPs and MPLs, we were once again reminded of the pervasive nature of our country's water challenges as we find ourselves in front of a locked two-song set at Maponya Mall due to there being no water in the building. While we were outraged at the fact that a place heavenly reliant on printers and laptops will lock the doors due to challenges presented by water, this highlighted the fact that the issues of water permeates every area of our society on a daily basis. I am reminded of Dr. Mutudi's words of yesterday that the issue of health care is deeply personal. I believe so too <clears throat> that the issue of water is very personal. In fact, I was also reminded, I'm reminded also TG. We even laughed about it, but we we're not supposed to. When the doctor said, those who are making policy on health issues and beneficiation should not be academics only, but also practitioners. Because what is cosmetic to a financial manager cannot be cosmetic to a woman who wants to reduce her boobs. And for me, that went very, very, very I mean, far away. Therefore, as the IFP, we are here today to gain deep understanding on the factors that are the root cause for South Africa's water challenges and how we can address it. Today, we extend our fact-finding mission by listening, considering, and commenting. I am therefore pleased to introduce our panelists, which is Mr. Uh, I must not... Uh, 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 Murder your, way, your, your names, yeah? As, as they did with me in New York. <laughs> <laughs> yes. That <laughs> dollar meaning. <laughs> uh, we've got Mr. Ashley, Ashley Stucky, Stucky. Stucky uh, who is the head of the Provincial Department of Water and Sanitation in KZ. And thank you very much for accepting our, our invitation. We've got Dr. Anthony Tatton. Uh, is online, and we've got uh, Professor Mike Muller, who is the former Director General of the Department of Water Affairs and Forestry. Uh, I will give the two gentlemen who are present here to make their presentation, and then we'll give Dr. Uh, Tatton online after them. I will start with Mr. Ashley Stucky, who is the Gaute, I mean KZN Provincial Head of Department and Water Affairs. Mr. Ashley Starkey is the provincial head of the Department of Water and Sanitation in KZN. He has been in public service for the past 37 years and has served in the water sector since 1997, <laughs> which is approximately 26 years. He was previously the head of corporate services for the Department of Water Affairs and Forestry in the Eastern Cape in King Williamstown and, left, and later served as the provincial head of water affairs for three years from 2010 to 2012, 
and in 2012 he was appointed as the provincial head of the Department of Water and Sanitation in Guazulu Natal. Some of his main functions as provincial head, amongst others, include supporting the sustainable provision of water services, ensuring the protection, use, development, conservation, management, control of water resources within the water management area, and monitoring the compliance of municipal drinking and water systems. Over to you, Mr. Staki, and guys, you take notes. So good morning, um, the Honourable President, members of Parliament, uh, colleagues, friends, and I think um, if you kindly allow me to my DG, uh, no, no, no. my former DG, sorry, <laughs> let me give a try to my former DG, we, we shared many, many years in the sector, and uh, I'm really honoured to be at your side, um, uh, Professor, indeed an honour. So, I, I start off with an apology. My DG uh, would have been here today, um, Dr. Sean Phillips. He unfortunately had another commitment, and I've been deployed to, to come and speak to you today. And <clears throat> the reason, one of the reasons why I was selected to come and speak to you today was basically because of, obviously, the province of KwaZulu-Natal, and most of your constituency base is, is around there. And I deal with... Uh, uh, President, I deal with all your, 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 your municipalities in, in KwaZulu-Natal, and I have a very uh, close relationship with your MMs, your, your mayors, etc., by name, but I won't mention any of them. <clears throat> so there are three fundamental questions which we've been asked to, to, to address today. Was firstly one, is the state of water and, and the root cause of some of the, the, the problems we're having. The second was around disaster management regulation, and thirdly, was around the role of the public, uh, the, the role of the private sector, which I'll, I'll very shortly address. In my, I have a presentation which I'm sure will be shared with you. Um, if we could just go to the next slide, which gives you some background on the supply and demand in, in South Africa. Do I have a thing about you here? Oh, okay, great, sorry. <laughs> Technology, you know, uh, Prof, there's so many young people that you and I have to learn from them here in the room. No, thank you very much on that. Uh, so, so one of the first things we do realize in South Africa that South Africa is a water scarce country. Now, some of you might differ to say we've had so much rain, et cetera, but the, 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 all indicators and, and all uh, is that we were one of the, uh, the 30th water scarce countries in the world. We know that currently, the, the, the water supply is in balance at the moment. However, there are localized areas where there's deficits, and I'll touch on that very briefly. Now, we also know that the, the, the water availability is quickly deteriorating, and the reasons, um, and the reasons have been the demands placed on water. Some of these have been economic, you'll see economic growth, and in, every country has economic growth issues, Population growth, we know that the numbers from, from where we were in, in the early 90s to now, there's been a, quite a population explosion. We've had urbanization. We know that many, many of our folk migrate to urban centers, in Gauteng, KwaZulu-Natal, and in Western Cape. And then the other issues which we, we really need to look at is the inefficient use of water. And this is primarily what, what, what we, we, we as a department are concerned about. The other environmental factors, the, de the degrading of our wetlands, the degrading of the environment, because these go with the health of our water sector and the health of our environment and the health of our people go hand in hand, and we need to, 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 to get that understanding. Now, one of the things, and we, we take ownership, that there have been some delays in the implementation of uh, various um, water res uh, resource projects, and I'll, I'll touch on them in my next slide to show you where we are with some of these major me mega projects. And I, I will talk across the country and not just case it in. I think what's important to note is the water mix as well. And you'll see my, my, my points there below. We need to, to look at sustainable use of, of groundwater, bore, the use of boreholes, spring protection. If you go in our rural areas, and I was in Babanango the other day to look at some of the, 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 the groundwater issues we have and the springs and spring protection. We need to look at efficient use of that. We need to look at, and if you come down to Durban, if you look at it, we've got one of the biggest coastlines. Are we sufficiently 
um, using desalination as an option, and, and, and that, that is one. We know it's quite costly, but there is a, a resource that we could use. Return flows from waste. Now we know we drink water, and it has to go somewhere. We know that. It's a fact. How efficiently are we using those return flows at our wastewater? And I'll touch on that uh, very briefly. Then the other is the supply side now. The water conservation side and the water demand side. It, 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 is, quite, it is quite disturbing to see um, the amount of water that is lost. And I'm not picking on any municipality or any institution, but the amount of water that is lost through wastage, and I'll touch on it again just now, Water conservation, water demand management is an issue that we as a department, together with various institutions, have been looking in. Uh, in KZN, we've got Mgeni Water that has, has, has been working very closely with us in terms of uh, putting some of these initiatives in place. But water conservation, water demand management is not at that municipal level. It is where you are. Your system that is dropping water, your tap that is wa dropping water, how many of us have that? So it starts with you and I, water conservation, and then we move it up with the bigger things. But if we each take ownership of that, and I think there's a myth that government's got to do everything. It's got to start with us. The ownership has got to start with us. So in terms of some of these, and, and Prof, you might remember some of these because these go back from your time. These are some of the major water resource projects which we're implementing uh, nationally. The Lesotho Highlands project, I'm sure you've seen the minister and the president was in Lesotho, and that finally we've, we've, got under, uh, we've got underway now after a few hiccups we've had, and that predominantly will provide, it, it really creates water security for the, the Gauteng area. In KwaZulu-Natal, president, one of the, the major projects we are, or have unlocked now is the Umkamazi project. Essentially what we will do, we will take water from, 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 from Harigwala um, District Municipality in, uh, around uh, Bulwa, and we'll put it into the Umgeni system. So it's from the Umkamazi system into the Umgeni system. Because we know in, 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 in Echeguini, we're quickly running out of, of sufficient water. If we don't implement this project within the next, year, uh, within the next couple of years, the Echeguini and the, related, um, the uh, related municipalities will be under permanent restrictions. Some of the others, uh, Prof, which you will recognize is the Moloko cro uh, Crocodile, the Makwap, the Olifants, um, the uh, raw water, the very famous Valha um, um the Imzumbubu for Eastern Cape colleagues. This project goes back from the, about the time when I was born, it was initiated, and finally there was an issue of funding. Now if you look at the Umkamazi project and the uh, Umzumbubu project, these are two huge projects. Uh, Eastern Cape is very much underdeveloped in terms of infrastructure, as well as KwaZulu-Natal, especially on the northern part of KwaZulu-Natal. So the issue with the Mkamazi, and I speak because I'm involved in that, was affordability. And, and, and we, through uh, my, my DG, uh, Dr. Sean Phillips, we have come up with a creative way of unlock, uh, to breaking the deadlock of the affordability and the funding, so as with the, with the Umzumvubu. The Khrot Lataba, as well as the Berg, there's two projects in the, in the, in the Western Cape. Um, the Clan William, which has been, Prof has been on the, the cards for decades now, but finally we've got that awarded and construction is taking place. Now with these big projects, one of the questions is the role of private sector. And as you see in my presentation, we say 60% of the funding comes from private sector because the fiscus will not be able to sustain the, 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 the funding of all these projects. So we do go into funding relationships, and I'll touch on some of that. One of the initiatives we had, the National uh, Water Resource Infrastructure Agency. The bill is out for, for consultation at the moment, and I do hope that you are providing your inputs in that, because this agency, again, we are looking at the efficient management of the infrastructure, the major infrastructure. It's not just building the infrastructure, but it's the future sustainability of that infrastructure. When we build a dam, and Prof will tell you this, we don't build a dam for five or 50 years. We intend to have that dam to be there for, well, I will only use the term eternity for as long as, as possible. So we, when we build, we ensure that it's done professionally, the costs are right, and that it's as a sustainable source that we have. Any of our dams, some of the dams that we have have been over 100 years in the country. So, 
the, 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 the infrastructure bill, I would like to invite you to, 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 to engage in comments on that. The next slide I, I'm going to pass on, this is just the financial issues we have and where the, the, the funding sources are. The issue is we, we, we get grants from, from um, the National Treasury. And then we have three sources, and you'll see the water resource management issues. I touched on that is where we, we secure our major water resources through, through dams, etc. Then we have municipalities, and this is where you, where you come in the space. And then we come to the water services provision. But let me, let, let me just step over this and touch on this. The next one is the financial viability of, 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 of the services we offer. Now, the first one is there is a tremendous amount that is owed to the department, to our trading entity. We sell water. We sell portable water to yourselves. Municipalities receive the water. They treat the water, and they reticulate it to the municipalities. And thereafter, the cycle it goes back into the system, treats it back into the system, into our rivers, and that's where the, the environmental issues. However, there is much money owed by the water boards, by municipalities, and by your customers. When I talk about customers, we talk about mining houses, business, etc. There is a huge amount there. So this is the first one, the challenge that we're sitting with. The second one, and very similar to Eskom as well, there is huge amounts of money that is owed to the water boards. Now in KwaZulu Natal, you might have seen that we merged Mplatuze and Umgeni Water. It's now called Mplatuze Together Water Board. And the reasons why we've merged that is to provide economies of scale and more efficiencies and also to service more our rural areas. Now, many municipalities are owing, have huge debts to water boards. And how will we be dealing with that? And I'll touch on it very shortly. And the third one is money owed to municipalities by your customers. Are they paying? And this is a huge, uh, your revenue collection at municipalities are at an all-time low, I would, if I can uh, use that term. So what are some of the solutions we are, we are proposing? The first one, with regards to, to uh, the non-paying by municipalities, we are proposing with Treasury that we should be withholding part of, part of your equitable share. Now, that's a huge statement. We are in discussions, we are in consultations. Because for us to become sustainable, we also need to collect revenue. Water, while we, 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 we profess that it is free, uh, free basic services, but free is not free. It, there is a cost associated with the service. So one of the uh, solutions we are proposing is looking at the equitable share and maybe saying we need to, 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 to uh, withhold some of that. The second one is putting more efficient to standardizing the, cross, the, the credit controls and, uh, within our, our, our water boards and looking at more enforcement uh, of some of the restrictions. Do we restrict municipalities that are not paying us? We provide the service. We have to, and, and Prof will tell you that even though you've got a damn wall there, there is a cost to maintain that. We have staff. We have electricity costs. And these are the costs which, which, which we, we pass on, which are all quite minimal, but we don't even get that back from you. So these are another aspect. And then another, the, uh, the solution we, we, we're also in consultation with is bulk prepared, meat, uh, prepared meters, which the municipalities uh, will be looking at. So this is quite a serious area in terms of our revenue collection. The municipalities, the revenue collection system, the rate of revenue collection, the number of bill customers, the accuracy of those bills, or, 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 or governance issues we need to look at. So let me touch on another issue. The Green Drop Report. Now, you know, Minister had launched the, the Green Drop, a uh, full Green Drop Report last year. The last one, Prof, unfortunately, was launched in 20, 2014, so we had a, about a nine year gap. And, what I, and the results of the Green Drop Report are quite disturbing. Now, what is the Green Drop Report? We go to, to various wastewater treatment plants, you sewage plants, we do an assessment, and we look at the health, and we make proposals to, to municipalities or the service providers in terms of, of what needs to be done. And these figures are, in, are published in a report, and you can see the source of the Green, uh, green Drop Report. It's from the, the, the Green Drop Report 2021. Look at these numbers. 
Of the 334 systems, 40% are in a critical state. 40%. Now, you've asked me what is the root cause. Now, I'll, I'll come to some of the root cause. 64 are poor to critical. And so, similarly, what, what it's indicating, um, <clears throat> and you'll see the, 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 the heat map that we have on the side, there are very few municipalities. If you look in KZN, let me use that because I'm from there, uh, we have Gungun Glovo, um, and uh, which, which show a fairly stable, uh, uh, received a fairly stable, and that's because we got the, the water board running these. But look at the red, look at the heat map of the red. And if you're not concerned, um, it's something that's... And so these, the, if you look at KZN, you're on the northern part of KZN, we, we, some of our municipalities are, are really in critical state. So when we talk health, we also got to look at what, what is happening from the time you receive the water to the time it goes into the, your, your, your wastewater systems to the time it comes back into the river systems and then ultimately flushed out. So this is one of the areas, and this is an indication of, of, of what is taking place. Now, what is happening? What does the department do? Let me just move to the next slide, sorry. So we as a department, we have a constitutional obligation, firstly, to support municipalities. We have a constitutional obligation. However, we have a regulatory obligation. We have an obligation to regulate these municipalities. And so it's, and oftentimes, this is one of the conundrums we have to deal with, how much support and when do we, are we the referee and player? And, and I'll share just now some of the suggestions we are making in order to regulate that. Minister has crisscrossed the country. In KwaZulu-Natal, he's, he's met with every single mayor, every single MM, every single CFO to understand what are your challenges. The other day, um, we were in Ladysmith with the Tugela president, was, uh, Honorable President was in um, uh, Ladysmith as well, and we were sharing some of the challenges in the, which, which need to be addressed in Tugela. Now, many of uh, what, when Minister met with, with, with the municipalities, we generally ag we agreed. We didn't generally agree. We agreed that there is a need for a that there is a need for an improvement plan at each of these service points that we have. And it's quite important be because, and I'll touch on some of the others. We, as a department, we provide in grant funding about 12 billion rand. And there are two main sources of the grant funding that we provide. It's your, 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 your regional bulk infrastructure, and that's where we provide bulk infrastructure from our dams, which is bulk pipelines, etc. And then we provide a, what we call a water services infrastructure grant. And the intention of a water services infrastructure grant is for immediate short-term interventions. Now, some of the, the, the examples of the support we provided, and I've got across the country, in Eastern Cape in Nelson Mandela Bay, we, we, we've got the Noit Gedag, and Prof, you'll remember the Noit Gedag as well. This goes back many, many years. <laughs> Noit Gedag phase one has been completed. Um, in, 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 in Eastern Cape, uh, we've got the greater Bizana bulk water supply. Um, I'm just going to jump. You'll see in KZN, we've got Umgeni water uh, supporting uh, Itegwini. And one of the things Minister has approved is that we've now taken, Umgeni water has taken over 10 of the wastewater treatment plants. Because we find that the municipality at, at this stage uh, is not, uh, does not have the sufficient capacity to manage. So Mgeni Water will take it over through an operation and maintenance agreement over the next 10, 15 years. Once we develop capacity and bring it up to the state, we'll hand it back to the municipality. And obviously in Western Cape, we've got Rockenstein, and in, in Pumalanga, we've got the Lekwa. Now, this support that we provide is also limited. What needs to happen and what is the cause? Because you want to know what is the root cause. And I'll go to bullet two. The root, the cause of declining uh, services is poor operations and maintenance, first and foremost. First and foremost, I have nothing else to say on it. We are not doing the basics. Secondly, secondly with regards to operations and maintenance is linked to revenue collection. Now, if you are able to, to bill your customer generate revenue, the intention of that revenue is to provide day-to-day -day 
operations and maintenance. And it's like your vehicle. If you don't put fuel in, yes, you can, you can fill the tank today. You're not going to make it to Durban because your car is going to stop. And this is basic operations and maintenance, which across the country is not being sufficient. Municipalities are not capping. We, we are estimating an 8 to 10 percent cap on operations uh, and maintenance budget. Many have zero, uh, less than uh, 5 percent to zero. And this is one of the challenges that municipalities are facing. Um, and, and, and I don't know how else to, to say it, but it's one of the, the, the areas that we really need to, to uh, municipalities need to, to, um, to look at. So, in order to arrest this decline, municipalities, as we say, we have to, and I'll show you in, in, in my next slide, and let, let me rather go to that. So this is some of the turnarounds for, this, uh, for the sector we are opposing. On the left is a negative down spiral we are going in. You have poor and declining services. You mentioned that we did not have uh, water at, at various offices, but we know that essential maintenance has got to take place. And let's give Randwater the, the, the credit that they gave sufficient warning to all, the, to all the users that you will have downtime of 54 hours. I can't remember the exact. So you should have put sufficient plans in place. The second aspect is reducing payments. This is, and, and let me go to the next one. Many municipalities, there is, they are poorly governed, poorly governed, poorly managed, underperforming, there are high losses. Go drive through your municipality, and if you do not see water in the street, I'll be very surprised. And there is extremely high cost, and the efficient inefficiencies of costs and others is there. So this is one of the causes that we have. Now, what is the turnaround? And this is, and this obviously is from my DG, and I'm, I'm, I'm using his slide. So the question is, how do we create professionally managed, take note of the language he uses, how do we create professionally managed, capable, efficient, and financially viable serv water service providers? And this is what we're proposing, and this will result, the turnaround strategy will run, is it'll increase investment. Investors know that we have a reliable water source. They would, they would not have a problem to come and, and invest in, in or set up companies in your particular area. For example, in KZN, we have the Dubai Trade Port which is, 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 is quite a, an investment hub. The improved services not only leads to reliability of water, but leads to reliability in terms of health, education, etc. Once you have a, a better service, you have increased revenue potential. And this, obviously, we're looking at professionally managed, capable, and efficient uh, institutions. So let me just go on to, 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 to share some, and again, I share this, there's a distinction between a water service authority and a water service provider. Now, in terms of the Constitution, Section 16, um, 165, the, the local water supply and sanitation services is the competency of our municipalities. The Minister of Cocteau, if you look at the third bullet, only a municipality can be allocated the power and functions to be a water service authority. And this power is delegated by the Minister, the minister of Cocteau. Now, <clears throat> the water services providers, municipalities can choose to have it. They can, in most instances, municipalities are both an authority and a provider. And, and, and in some instances, uh, water services authorities may approve a legal entity, like um, a municipality, a municipal entity, um, See, uh, we, we can have NGOs, organs of state, we can have water boards to provide the service. The, the, the Act requires that both the water service authority and the water service provi uh, provider functions are to be managed and to be accounted for se separately. And we find this is not happening with our municipalities. So the key role of water, uh, the water service authorities is to ensure that water ser services provide, the water service providers meet the minimum norms and standards, both for water and sanitation. And the norms and, the norms and standards have been, have been determined. We as a regulator, as a department, we provide these guidelines to, to, to municipalities. So, 
and this is quite, and probably this will uh, spark some debate. What are we proposing? We're proposing some, as the department, we're proposing uh, some reforms to the, the amendments to the Water Services Act, and these are three amendments we're proposing. The first one, we want to introduce a legal requirement which says that water services can only be, uh, can only be provided by a legal entity that is licensed. Now, some of our, our municipal um, uh, water service authorities, we've seen the, the, the type of service that they're offering, which is quite. So if we are able to license them, we are able to set up the standards, we are able to determine the capacity, not only the capacity, the level of professionalism that they should be performing. And hence, one of the, pro uh, the, the proposals we are uh, recommending in the Act is to have water service providers and water service authorities licensed. Means you will, it's, it's like other entities as well. So the details of this obviously will be gazetted by minister. We will supply the, the minimum competency and the minimum performance levels. This is the leadership we as a department will provide. So if a municipality meets those criteria, we will license them. Because you find many municipalities just do not have the, the, the ability or the capability to provide these services. The next one is in terms of Section 63. Now, Section 63 is both a support. We are wanting to, 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 to in terms of the amendment, to strengthen the enforcement uh, aspect, uh, the enforcement role by the department. Means, and again, we will, we will provide some of the, the details of the Section 63. <coughs> Section 63 primarily means that the department may or a competent institution may take over the functions of a water service. And then the, the, the third uh, aspect we look at is to define the functions that the water service authorities, the water service providers are, are, are accountable uh, irrespective of the institution. So it's there in the slide. So let me just move on and I won't touch on this one. So this just reflects some of the grants that we have from Treasury. Regional bulk, you can see that's a grant that is it's a direct and indirect grant. The MIG, Obviously, you know that COCTER manages the MIG and these huge amounts. The Water Services Infrastructure Grant uh, that we have. And then for, for metros, we have the Urban Settlement Grant, which, which should be used. So these are some of the, 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 the grants that are available to municipalities. The, the other question that was asked, what is the role of the public sector? Now this, and, and this debate has been one of the, has started off in the beginning to say, the, 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 sorry, the, the private sector. The private sector is the recipient of much of the service. The private sector is that that drives the economy. And what is their role? They, they should not be sitting back and saying, government, government, provide. So what we've done as a department, uh, we've established a partnership office which resides in the DG's office. There is a head, um, it's, I think it's Mr. Lubby that has been appointed, and the role of the, 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 the uh, water partnership office. Firstly, <coughs> is that we want to standardize the national programs for the private sector participation. I think you're also aware of the PPP approach of public-private partnerships. <coughs> Excuse me, and this is also linked to that. We want to make it quicker and easier for municipalities to enter into partnerships, and we will provide the guidance, and I'll touch on, <coughs> I'll touch on another slide to that. We will also look at blended fi financing and look at other sources of funding because we should not be limited just to, to government for funding. Now, some of the, 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 the partnerships that... <coughs> Sorry, can I just grab a glass? <laughs> Thank you. So some of the areas we were looking towards the private sector to enter into partnerships is non-revenue water. Now, what is non-revenue water? It's obviously leaks. It's customers that are not registered. It's where we have uh, indigents that are, are, are receiving water. And illegal connections. You'll be astounded by the number of illegal connections that we have in this country, and it's not accounted for. Uh, come to KwaZulu-Natal, you'll see massive, huge houses um, with big pools in the rural areas. And all of those are full up. And the question we ask ourselves, is how many of them are paying for water. And the issue of cost recovery, those are, so that is one area where the private sector can assist us. Management contracting as well. 
Wastewater treatment management, I mentioned that and we looked at the green drop report. Water reuse, I mentioned that as well. Uh, these are some of the areas we would invite uh, private sector and desalination and other, and other, and other areas. And I'm, I'm finished, I'm just one more slide. So what have we done? Some of the initiatives, we've, we started with four key initiatives. The first one is the National Infrastructure Agency, which has been set up. And again, I challenge you to, to, to the bill is out for consultation. Please give us your inputs in terms of the bill. The next one, which is quite interesting, and you can speak to any of your municipalities where you govern, is participation in the infrastructure fund. You might have heard of the BFI, the, 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 the infrastructure fund. Some of the, in, in, um, with the Mkamazi project, how we unlock that, we, pr we provided BF, we, we got funding from the infrastructure fr fund, which made it more affordable uh, for some municipalities. So they provide funding, and I know there's quite a few municipalities applying for that. And then the third aspect is this water partnership office, and I'll, I'll, the presentation with, is with you. We partnered, to, we partnered with DBSA, reporting through, through, through our department. We obviously uh, engaged SALGA, and these are the aspects they will look at. And then finally, we'll be looking at, at, at provincial partnerships. And just to share one example, and I know, uh, uh, chairperson, I'm over time, but just we have a case study, and Prof, you might remember this, in Polokwane, we had the likes of Anglo-American and, and SAB coming into partnership, and they assisted in some of these aspects which I've, I've, I've touched on. So there you are, um, chairperson, honorable president, Thank you very much, and I hope I've addressed your areas. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Starkey. Um, I think we've learned a lot about water. Uh, there's, there's, there are, there are, there are, there are uh, big uh, terms here about desalination. <coughs> desalination means taking water from the sea and to keep it dry so that it's drinkable. <laughs> they say it's, it's expensive, a president, to do that, but I think for me that's the way to go because we've got, the, I mean, our coastal line, it's big. In fact, we are surrounded by the sea. is two oceans, in fact, the Atlantic and Indian Ocean. So we should not really be a water scarce country, but again, well, yeah. No, John I didn't know that that was an illegal connection of what I South African size. <laughs> <laughs> hey, thank you very much, Mr. Starkey. I think uh, mem members have taken um, notes uh, for questions when we will come to that. Uh, we are now go straight to Dr. Anthony Tatton. I am assured that is uh, online. Welcome, Dr. Anthony Tatton from the Center for Environmental Management at the University of the Free State. Yes, good. Uh, let me introduce you properly, Prof, before you start. Yes, good. Dr. Anthony Tatton is a professor at the Center for Environmental Management at the University of the Free State. His doctorate was part of a program developed to better understand water as a national security risk. He serves as an officer in the National Intelligence Services, AIBO, operating in a team task with the responsibility of developing the intelligence platform for what becomes, became CODESA. He became a founding member of the South African Civil Services where he serves as a deputy head of a techno-economical intelligence unit focusing on technology acquisition needed to stimulate economic growth post-1994 in his role as a divisional head of C-11, as staff officer to C-1, he was responsible, don't ask me what is C-1 and C-2, responsible for liaising with potential new clients of intelligence products. It was in, the, in this capacity that he linked up with ESCOM in the late 1990s and refined his work on water as a national security risk. After leaving the service and occupying international roles, he gained a deeper knowledge of the water energy food nexus, which he brought back to South Africa as a South African Water and Energy Forum. His current work is actionable commercial intelligence derived from A1 as it applies to advanced process control in capital intense industry. 
He has been a member of various legal teams where water is a central factor, including successful litigation against the Harris Smith municipality regarding their sewage management. Other recent cases involve litigation against the Lesotho Highlands Development Authority in an international commercial dispute linked with the Lesotho Highlands Water Project and the defense of a client wrongly accused of lawful sand mining in the Moy River. His work is water quality led to first commercial application, a wastewater as a civilian tool for the detection of path yeah, yeah, yeah. That's cool, isn't this? of pathogens in sewage in sewage. This led to the successful implementation of wasteful surveillance program at Anglo uh, Platinum. Uh, Prof, you will really help us with these legal connections of what I was not aware of. It is my pleasure to introduce uh, <coughs> Professor Anton Tatum. Over to you, sir. Good morning to you. Thank you very much. It's a deep pleasure indeed. Uh, I recognize all of the, uh, the the leadership and the dignitaries in the room. You must appreciate I cannot see them because I can only see my own face on this TV screen here. But I uh, recognize uh, the uh, Prince uh, Mangusutu Butelezi, who I believe is there. And I would also like to today just to pay my respects to Dr. Ndombela from Klabisa, the former municipal manager from Klabisa. Who, uh, who passed away recently. Uh, he was transferred from Klabisa, which is where my family closely with him. His father and my father knew each other very well in the 1920s when my father was a young, young, young boy learning how to become a man at Klabisa. So my roots, my family roots, my name is Kaoleza. That's my traditional name. And my father's traditional name is Umklangabodwe uh, from, uh, from Klabisa. So I pay my respects to to all of you as the as the leaders of the IFP. Uh, it's uh, indeed a very deep privilege to speak with you today and to hopefully bring some wisdom to bear on the matter at hand. I'm going to take a slightly different uh, tack. I, I fully recognize uh, Mr. Starkey and I also recognize uh, Professor Mike Muller, both the highly respected people in the water sector and we work very closely together. So you actually have in the room today, you know, some of the top people, and I recognise them all for their for their relative uh, expertise. So I'm not going to repeat what in what what uh, Mr. Starkey said and what I believe that uh, Professor Mood is likely to say after me. So I'm just going to come in with a slightly different angle here. Uh, you are you are dealing at the moment with a very complex issue as a political party, a registered political party in South Africa. We are we are in the in the midst of a number of crises, and one of the crises, one of the one of the many crises, is a human health crisis. And uh, arguably, there are many faces to that human health crisis, but probably one of the important faces of that human health crisis is the current cholera uh, crisis that has happened in South Africa. We've just lost over thirty people's, uh, so more than thirty people have, have have died as a direct result of cholera. And I believe that this is a very, very important moment of inflection in South Africa, uh, in the water sector, and I'll tell you why. If you recall, uh, some years ago, there was this famous case of uh, Oscar Pistorius, uh, who uh, was found guilty and sent to sent to court, uh, sent to prison for uh, for taking the life of his uh, fiance. And uh, the the principle there that was used was dolus eventualis. Dallas Eventualis was that uh, says that if you do something that is uh, that is uh, got the potential to take the life of, of, of another person accountable, you are liable for the loss of life of that person. And I believe we're starting to see that now in this in this cholera case because uh, I'm aware of a number of forensic teams. Uh, I'm part of some of the some of these. I'm on the peripheries of some of these forensic teams, so I am aware of some of the forensic work that's being done by by these teams. And they are looking at the moment to to directly link the loss of those lives to uh, to contracts that were given uh, uh, in this particular case to uh, to the Royval Sewage Works, where there was a whole lot of uh, contractual irregularities, a whole lot of uh, of criminal activity taking place um, uh, uh, within the the awarding of those contracts. So so if if those teams are successful in creating a causal link between the issuing of a fraudulent contract or a contract that has bypassed the normal procurement process, ultimately linking it to the death of individuals. 
then of course they have a donus eventualis case. And this is something that I think is going to fundamentally alter the water sector in South Africa. And this is one of the reasons why I believe at the moment the Minister of Water Affairs and the current DG are going out of their way to 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 start pushing back on criminal charges, uh, you know, charging uh, certain municipalities that are delinquent because they recognise the significance of this dolus eventualis. They recognise the importance of what I'm saying now. So I'm, I'm speaking to you now today with that background. I would like to suggest that um, one of our, our big issues today in the in the in the in the, the water sector is our inability to manage our sewage as a country. So let me just focus a little bit on the sewage crisis. South Africa, being water constrained, as you've heard already, we rely on a system known as indirect reuse of water. So what we do is we take water from sewage, and because people don't want to drink sewage water, they don't, they, 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 they don't trust it. Uh, so what we do is we take that water and we treat it through a wastewater treatment plant and we then put it back in a river through a pipe. And that pipe that goes into the river is what the Green Drop Report is about. The Green Drop Report tells us what the quality of the water is going back into the river. And the reason why the Green Drop Report is so critically important is because that water is going to flow down the river and it's then going to go back into a bulk water treatment plant where it's going to become drinking water. And unfortunately, in KZN, we, particularly in Neteguini, but with any, with any town, any, any town or city in, uh, in, in KZN, we are at the bottom end of a long river. And therefore, many people upstream from us have put their sewage in the river multiple times by the time the, the, the water gets down to uh, to where we are, it's been through many, many different kidneys and uh, many of these uh, uh, potable water treatment plants are now being overloaded to uh, produce potable water. So I think that our sewage crisis is probably one of our single most important human health-related uh, aspects in South Africa at the moment. And I want to just uh, draw attention to the dignitaries in the room because this is the leadership of the IFP. This is the leadership of a significant political party that can make a difference and can has the ability to, to take control in, in a number of municipalities where this matters. The green drop, uh, we cannot get into an airplane uh, on, a, on, an, on an international airline and be happy that 60% of the time that airplane lands safely again. That means 40% of the time it doesn't land safely. We can't do that. We need, we need the highest level of compliance because our people, human beings, ordinary human beings that depend on you, the leaders of this party, they depend on you for your wisdom and the guidance to protect them. And we need to, comp we need to reach the highest level of compliance what does liberation of, of our people mean if we now still have to live in servitude for the rest of our lives because we have to, we have to uh, uh, walk in towns through, uh, through raw sewage that's slopping around our feet? This is not liberation. This is not, this is not living life with dignity. Uh, so I think it's an important matter. So Green Drop Report, as far as I'm concerned, is an extremely, extremely important document, and we need to comply with that, uh, and we need to make sure that, that, that everything is done to improve on that, the sewage crisis is 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 a complicated crisis, and 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 a, a, a lot of the work that I do is I work behind the scenes. You've heard uh, in my in my introduction, I'm a former intelligence officer, so I understand the uh, you know the 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 intelligence aspects of of these things. So I work a lot in a low profile way, and I work a lot to do with uh, with forensic work uh, that ends up in, in often in court cases. So I'm busy at the moment now with some uh, very advanced investigations into uh, into sewage, into into the sewage crisis in the country. And and um, Mr. Starkey said that uh, the um, and I fully agree with him that the operations and maintenance is a, is a serious challenge in South Africa. So I've got no issue with him on that point at all. However, what I am noting is that one of the reasons of the failure of our sewage our infrastructure is sabotage. Uh, we're busy working on a case that's about to come to court at the moment now, where there's a, a criminal syndicate that actively sabotages the sewers. We've got all the documentary evidence, we've got all the video evidence, that we've got very, very hardcore forensic evidence that will stand up in any court of law. And uh, what happens is people 
damage infrastructure. They damage it, they destroy it. And it can be either sewage infrastructure or it can be potable water infrastructure. And, and the modus operandi of these criminal gangs or these criminal syndicates are, are both identical uh, criminals. They sabotage the, uh, the, the pipelines by putting rocks and tires and foreign objects down the sewers. And they then cause the sewage to, uh, to come up to the surface. And the flood flows through people's houses, flows through people's businesses. And if you want to know what this looks like, then you just look no further than um, than 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 uh, Vereniging, uh, the Val, what used to be called the Val Triangle. Uh, uh, it's a it's a absolute uh, absolute mess. Uh, so it's cost so far at least over three billion rand to try and fix it. And I still haven't managed to fix it. So. Once the sewage starts flowing freely, what, what the syndicate then does is they say, oh, but we have a solution for you. Uh, here's our pump. And, they, and they, they will rent out a pump to the municipality for 250,000 rand per pump per month. One particular individual is earning 4 million rand per month without any overhead costs just by doing this. 4 million rand per month per one, one, one criminal syndicate, uh, one person that's, that's, that's doing this. And the same thing's happening in our drinking water systems because... Uh, the tanker operators, people that now get contracts to supply water through tankers, they sabotage their, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the water supply. Uh, I happen to live in, uh, in the, uh, the Ugu district uh, down at Port Shepston area, and uh, I'm closely monitoring our water supply within the complex that I live in. And at the moment, we have water supply over the last uh, three months. We've only had water supply for approximately 16% of the time. Uh, water supply of, 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 of a pressure that is usable. And that is all caused by sabotage. People are sabotaging the lines in order to get the contracts for the, uh, for the, uh, the, the tanker services. And now the problem with this is, and this is where the forensic work goes back to, uh, to that, uh, that case uh, up, at, um, up in Gauteng, uh, the Royval sewage case, is where there's the tanker services being offered there. And those tanker services do not necessarily fill up their water at the potable water stamp up because the operator gets paid on, uh, for the delivery of, of, of each uh, tanker load. And he doesn't want to go and stand in a queue of 20 different trucks that have to be filled up. So he, uh, he just wants to sell, uh, if he can sell 10 tanker loads that day, he's going to make 10 times more money than if he can only sell one tanker load per day. And, uh, there, and that's the problem. That's the problem. Our system incentivizes these criminal activities because in the case of the tanker services, they simply go and draw water from the river and they then go on, on to fill up the tanks, you know, or go and, go and sell it onto whatever because they can then build a municipality for a load of water. And this is, I'm afraid, unacceptable. And, and if we get the forensics right in, this, uh, in the Hamas Kral case, then we're probably going to be able to tie that all together through tanker service operators. That's a work in progress at the moment. We haven't yet quite got there, but we are working there. And my own observation in KZN, in Ugu, is that uh, I, I, I watch these tankers going past, I watch them at the standpipes, and there's very often 10 tankers at a standpipe, and uh, there are also tankers going straight down to the, uh, to the river. So, so this is what it is. But no, what are the health implications? Be because because uh, of our, our infrastructure is failing, as Mr. Starkey says, because our, our operations and maintenance is, is, is uh, underfunded and, and, and we don't have enough skilled people to do it, I believe the proximate cause of that failure is very often the sabotage, this criminal activity called sabotage that I've mentioned. That is the actual proximate cause in a legal, in a legal context. That is, that is what... That is, that is like the like the like the, the the finger that pulls the trigger that you know that releases the bullet that kills the person. It's that it's that uh, sabotage, and uh, municipalities don't have the capacity to police this, and the Department of Water and Sanitation certainly does not have the capacity to police this. So this is something that happens out there, and this is almost I would think a cultural thing, and I think this is where the IFP can play a very big role, because the IFP has always been a traditional cultural based organization that's always reached out to the you know, to the cultural roots of the of, of, of the Zulu people and I think this is a very very important and very very powerful thing we saw this happening in the in the riots in, in um, I think it was 1921 if my memory serves me correctly where we saw the, those traditional values coming in and helping to calm down what was rapidly escalating into a very violent and ugly thing so I fully recognize the power and the authority of those traditional leadership structures. And I would like to appeal to, to, to those traditional leaders today through the IFP 
to start policing this sabotage story that I'm telling you about. Start policing these illegal tanker operations and these illegal uh, sewage uh, 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 destruction operations. I think it's very, very important. Um, what 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 diseases can we can we see coming out of this? Well, the first thing that we see is that uh, cholera. We're living in a cholera crisis, and I don't know if the, if the audience is aware of this, but uh, we've just been through a COVID uh, an, a, a COVID pandemic, a global pandemic. Uh, we all know about that. We know how disruptive that was to our economy. We know the destruction that caused. But I don't know if the audience is aware of the fact that we are also currently in a cholera pandemic. And this cholera pandemic, unlike the COVID pandemic, it's a global pandemic, but unlike the COVID pandemic, it, is, it has been a long, long cycle. In fact, the current cholera pandemic cycle, it's either the sixth or the seventh pand global pandemic cycle, uh, identified by the fact that there's a very specific pathogen, a very specific mutation of, of the cholera organism, the cholera germ that, uh, that causes the disease, was first identified in the late 1960s uh, in Indonesia, and then it went over to S Southeast Asia, into Russia, and then into uh, Italy of all places, and Spain, and then it came down into Africa, from the north of Africa down. And we still today are in, in that same pandemic because it's the same strain of, of cholera that's coming through. But the, the, the significance of this is that when cholera was first reported in the 1960s and 70s, the mortality was in the order of 60%. So in other words, six out of every 10 people that got cholera would die at that point in time. Six out of 10 would die. Today, the, the, the mortality rate is very low. It's, some, it's less, less than 1%, maybe 2%. Uh, so now there's over 100 people that get, uh, get cholera today, provided they are treated, only one, maybe two of them will die. So, so, so the cholera is still out there, and we are dicing with death by allowing the sewage crisis of ours to carry on because sewage and cholera are directly linked. And we know this from work that was done in the, in the 1800s in London where cholera was first identified as the cause of, uh, of, 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 of human death uh, from this particular pathogen. But there's another thing that I think, I believe, affects the rural areas far more than, than what we are aware of. And I, and I alert this learned group of leaders today uh, to this factor. Hepatitis A. Um, it, I'm told from um, uh, medical people that I uh, speak to on a regular basis, I'm told that hepatitis is a significant problem in KZN. Hepatitis A, which is waterborne. And uh, I don't know if anyone's ever made the actual link between hepatitis A and wastewater management, but I believe there's a very strong link. And this one case I'm working on at the moment now, we are actually doing the, the, the forensic work on, 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 on identifying hepatitis A specifically related to these criminal activities with the sabotage of these, uh, of these sewer lines. So hepatitis A is a very important thing. And I would like to urge the leadership in the room today to go back to their constituencies and to try and ask questions to determine the extent of hepatitis as a as, as a factor, as a health factor in the rural communities. And I believe you might well be surprised to see that it is far more significant than what you thought it was. And it might not have been reported as a water related issue. People might have just taken it. Oh, well, it's hepatitis. Uh, but, uh, but it's actually directly related to water. And of course, it's related to water that is contaminated by sewage. And it's contaminated uh, um, either by, by dysfunctional uh, septic tanks in the, in the rural areas or by the free-flowing uh, uh, sewage uh, into our systems, which brings me into a, a, an area of specific, specific interest to us in KZN here, and that is the Mzumkulu River. The Mzumkulu River is the last of our free-flowing rivers in South Africa that's of, of any significance. There's one other river in Eastern Cape that's also free-flowing, but the Mzumkulu is the last of the rivers that doesn't have any regulatory, flow regulatory structures on it. And the importance of the Mzumkulu River to the people of Ugu district is very, very uh, high because the Mzumkulu River is fed by the Mzumkulwano River, which comes from the Harding area. And there's a dam on that river that is highly, but highly contaminated by, uh, it's called the Farmer's Dam. And it's highly contaminated by sewage and also, uh, 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 so it's so contaminated that they, uh, cattle farmers can no longer allow their cattle to drink from that water because if they do, the cattle either get sick or they die. Now, that same water goes down the Mzumkulwana River into the Helens Rock pump station, which then feeds into the, into the supply, the water supply of, uh, of, 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 the, the, of the Ugu district, which is a very, very large district municipal area. 
that, that starts in the sort of south coast of uh, just south of Durban, uh, Itaguini, and it goes all the way down to you know, down to uh, further south in Port Shepston, uh, Port Edward, that area. So it's a very, very large area, and a lot of it is semi-rural, and uh, uh, it's, uh, it's an area that's very poorly serviced at the moment. So, so I would like to raise the, uh, raise the awareness amongst the esteemed audience today of leaders uh, about the need to protect to know traditional value of the Mzumkulu River and to protect that because at the moment there's also activity taking place there, unlawful mining, unlawful sand mining activity that is causing all kinds of problems in the Mzumkulu River. Uh, River. So sewage flows coming from from upstream is a is a problem, and then also uh, we've got this uh, unlawful sand mining uh, in the uh, in the river. Uh, uh, and uh, I'm I'm hoping to be able to work with Mr. Starkey uh, uh, on this matter because I think it's a matter that's it's a it's a matter of great importance. It's an infringement of Section 21 C and I of the National Water Act, and uh, we have lots of forensic evidence uh, 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 for that as well. So I'm busy working with one of uh, Mr. Starkey's colleagues, uh, um, um, Ms. Abubakar, at the moment on, on this matter. So, uh, so it's just in, it's just... so, so with you, that, okay, as, I see as, my, as you I conclude, Professor. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. I can, I can. Yeah, can as, I conclude? You, can my, as you conclude, yes. Okay, yeah, can, can, can I, can I, must I conclude now? Okay, thank you very much. Okay, I would just like to conclude by saying one thing, and that is that in KZN, we must be very proud of the fact that we have been leaders, national leaders, in the recycling of wastewater. I don't know if, if, uh, if, if uh, most people are aware of the fact that the Durban South Wastewater Treatment Works was the first wastewater treatment works in the country to recycle sewage water, uh, bring it back as industrial process water. That was a world. That was a that was a South African first, and I think we must be very proud of that. And I just close by saying that this desalination debate, this is an important debate for the future. Desalination is no longer expensive, and in fact, it's been pioneered in in in, in Itaguini. Once again, it's been pioneered there. There's been a program ongoing uh, between uh, one of the Japanese uh, companies, engineering companies, and uh, and the the municipality there, where they 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 they've, they've uh, run trials called the remix uh, process where they've taken a sewage effluent and they've put it through a desalination plant and they've reduced the cost of uh, of producing desalinated seawater to equal roughly the cost of, of of buying the same water from uh, from, uh, from rivers and, and from dams so the cost of desalination is certainly going down and i also am fully aware of the fact that private sector people are very interested in actually investing into that space in a proper proper regulated uh, uh, way, uh, but, but private capital, I know for a fact, is willing to go into that space. So I think this is uh, the, uh, the hope for the future. So in closing, I thank you very much for the opportunity to address you. I wish you very, very well. And I and I just remember that the ANC is the power, but they're not in control. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Tutton. And uh, I hope you will stay for questions after um, <clears throat> Where's my papers now? Uh, guys, I hope you have been taking notes. Uh, President, I think as the IFP, we need to re refine our voice as we did in the 90s when you, the, our country was transitioning from apartheid to, to democracy, where the IFP has a very strong moral voice. Because all our problems, either health or water, it's all man-made problems. People are creating problems to make money at the expense of citizens. Yes. It's happening with electricity, it's happening now with water. I'm shocked. 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 <laughs> <laughs> I'm shocked. No. I'm I'm shocked, and I really want to. I uh, once again thank you, Gustave uh, Kulu, uh, uh, um, is the leader of Caucus and the Chief Whip for arranging this. And this should not be the last. This should be the norm. We're, we're discussing it this morning with the Deputy President that it must be the norm on all topics because it's empowering everyone. Minister Manja, I've got questions for the Cocta uh, MEC in the legislature on water issues. Yeah, send them my questions. 
Uh, without wasting time, let's uh, take to Professor Mike Muller, who is the former Director General of South Africa's Department of Water Affairs and Forestry. Uh, he is a registered professional civil engineer and an uh, NRF rated visiting adjunct professor at the University of the Vetvatas Run School of Governance. He is a member of the WHO and UNICEF Strategic Advisory Group to the group which monitors progress on the water and sanitation SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals. He is a National Planning Commissioner from 2010 to 2015. He focused on the infrastructure, environment and regional development as a DG of Water Affairs and Forestry from 1997 to 2005. He led the development and implementation of the new water policy legislation and programs. Before that, he managed infrastructure and policy programs at the DPSA from 1998 to 1994. Was a co-founder of the Mvula Trust in 1993 and managed water and sanitation programs for the Mozambican government from 1979 to 1998. It, this reminds me, a, a, the president of the meeting you held with the former ministers in Pretoria organized by our former chief whip, that one of the mistakes we have done as a country is not to tap in that talent. Most of them are consultant for African countries. That's why they're developing more than us. They are working there. Tinasachi last buffoon. International, international engagements have included chairing the World Economic Forum's Agenda Council on Water in 2012 and 2014, and membership of the Global Water Partnership Technical Committee, and the UN Secretary General's Milan Project Task Force on Water and Sanitation. It is my pleasure to welcome and uh, introduce Professor Mula, and thank you very much for availing your expertise to us. Thank you very much, Professor. Uh, thanks for that, uh, program director, uh, moderator, and greetings uh, to the honourable honourables, to the honourable delegates, to the, and then very, very particularly to the honourable junior delegates. And I take the Nigerian approach I heard first in Abuja, which simply was all protocols observed. So please consider all protocols have been observed. Thanks. Um, I'm very pleased that you put on uh, Mr. Uh, Dr. Tertner ahead of me. I really have to say before we move in that uh, I've been dealing with Dr. Turton ever since he came out of national intelligence when the report came saying that there was going to be wars in water, about water in southern Africa. At the time we were negotiating with SADC how to share our rivers and there haven't been any wars about water. Um, and I discovered the author of that report was indeed Dr. Turton. Dr. Turton also told us that acid mine drainage was going to dissolve the, the CBD of Johannesburg some years ago. And last time I drove th through the CBD, there's lots of things destroying the CBD, but acid mine drainage is not one of them. And so I really do get worried when we get told that the latest scare is a particular kind of hepatitis or cholera, and we need to take X, Y, Z, measures. And one of the problems that we have is that there are people, and we know this, who make money by causing sabotage to water installations and get people to then have to do something else. I would simply caution, because I watched how the consulting industry works, be very cautious about somebody who on the one hand is working for a group of people where it's on, on a legal case, for instance, as an advisor, and on the other side is talking about that and what, building up fears about a particular issue. Because we've just had a very good example of if you are working for something and you're trying to promote a cause, it's quite useful to come and talk about that from your perspective without declaring, but in this case Dr. Turton did declare, his interests. He's advising one side in a court case. And therefore, we need to be a little bit cautious. And I'm very concerned about the suggestion that cholera in South Africa is being caused by poor sewage treatment. Poor sewage treatment is existing. It's causing lots of other problems. 
But I've been speaking to the Medical Research Council and various other medical institutions about the cholera epidemic, saying, can we please have some details about precisely what happened in Paris and Hamans Kral? Because it is very important for us to understand exactly how this is transmitted. And I do not believe that the cases which we are seeing are caused by poor sewage treatment. Because you see, I used to work with cholera. When I was in Mozambique, we had an epidemic in Beira, which where I was running this, the, the water system, and we had to try and understand how to stop that epidemic. And we got into a lot of detail about it then. And the other occasion was when we had a cholera outbreak in, in, which started in Guelazana. In Guelazana? Yeah? KZN, yeah, up, up there, I, you know, I'm never sure which municipality is which these days, but you know that old hospital in Guelazana where there was a, a, a case of cholera and then it spread all the way through KwaZulu-Natal, do you remember that? Went down to Etequini, went up to Newcastle. And I said, this is very strange, this is a waterborne disease, but look how it runs. It starts in Guelazana and goes down the road to Etequini. It spreads in Etiquini and it goes up the road to Newcastle. I didn't know that there was a river that flowed from uh, in Guelazana down to Etiquini. So how did the water get down there? I didn't know there was a river that, flew, that was flowing uphill from Etiquini to Newcastle. So we must be very careful about saying that cholera is caused by polluted water in our taps. I'm afraid to say that cholera is usually transmitted once it arrives, person to person, sharing food. In Guelazana, there was a beer drink for someone who had arrived from Mozambique. This is what the doctor who actually investigated the case, he went to the first case, and he found that they'd had a party, they were drinking beer, they were eating from a common pot, and that's where you transmit cholera. And I've spoken to our health people, and if you listen carefully to the messages, they are now saying about cholera, and do remember that washing your hands is very important. Actually, cholera is spread person to person by poor hygiene. And one of the reasons it's bad in Hammanskral is because the water supply is bad and not trusted, and lots of people don't have water. It's very difficult to keep hygienic practices where you don't have water. So I'm very concerned that we should not be saying, oh, the cholera is caused by the municipality failing to run the sewage works. The cholera is caused because people aren't able to practice good hygiene, aren't encouraged to practice good hygiene. And you know, it's crazy. We were washing our hands because of COVID. I can tell you we need far more to wash hands because of cholera, particularly when we have funerals, when we have festivals, when we have parties. That is where cholera gets spread. It might arrive occasionally through water. And if someone delivers a tanker full of water to a police college and it came out of a polluted stream, then you can transmit cholera like that. But I can promise you that cholera normally, once it arrives, spreads between people, not in the water. And I say this having worked with some of the best uh, health and water scientists in the world with the World Health Organization, so I don't say this lightly. But I get very worried when I hear people trying to use stories, create fear, and then promote particular courses of action, whether it's legal action or commercial action. Because what this does is it takes our eyes off the real problems and focuses them on something which is maybe of interest because we want to sell tankers full of water, or we want to do consulting work, or we want to give expert evidence in a legal case. So I would just caution you to be very careful about how we hear things and what we believe and whether we check it. Now, I was going to give you a presentation, so let me get on to the presentation. I'm sorry, but I was provoked there. I was provoked. Um, <laughs> yeah, and, and we were allowed. Prof prof professors are allowed to fight with each other, so that's fine. Thank you. Okay. Um, we were asked to look at a couple of things. Let me just see if this thing works. Ah, there we go. What's, what's the root causes of the challenges? And I'm afraid to say I tend to agree with my former colleague. I, I think he used to be my subordinate, you know, but I, people now, uh, they don't give me the same respect that they used to. Um, <laughs> I don't do their performance appraisals anymore. Um, what are the root causes in the water services? And you've heard this from Ashley. Um, 
We always talk about the old infrastructure being inadequate. And hold on, the old infrastructure is old and it serves a certain number of people. How many people does it serve today? And I want to come back to that. Poor operation and maintenance. The life of infrastructure depends on in operation and maintenance. And if it's not done, <laughs> you'll have poor infrastructure. That's not caused by poor infrastructure. It's caused by you, the managers, who didn't do the management. Sorry, I shouldn't say you, the managers. I know you're not all the managers here. Um, but one of the problems we have is that there really is poor maintenance and operation, and so the infrastructure doesn't work as well as it should. We've heard as well that municipalities just don't collect the money they should, should collect to do the work anyway. Don't they want the money? Well, actually, I think they, we must be honest. Going and collecting money, particularly in our communities, for water, which is an essential, is difficult. People have trouble. Some people choose between food and water. I'm going to come back to that. But we don't collect the money. And then we talk about the municipal incapacity, unqualified staff, not enough money. I think we should also recognize, and we saw the consequences of this in the, the Tequini floods, that the way we let our human settlements develop without proper planning, without proper drainage, without proper infrastructure, it doesn't take a climate change storm to then cause damage. That, that damage will cause, be caused by a normal storm. And certainly my hydrological friends tell me that the storm that did so much damage in Etiquini was a normal big storm. But what's happened since the last one is there's another three million people all around Etiquini who don't have proper drainage, don't have proper uh, roads and, and services. And that has caused a lot of the destruction that we saw and the death. So we must remember that uh, settlement planning is important. And all of these causes I, and uh, Mr. Singh, you know, as, as an MP, you should know me better than that. You know, I used to be very polite in Parliament. I don't have to be polite anymore. <laughs> if you're going to ask me to come and talk to a political party, I'm going to say the politicians are part of the problem. Because what we need to make water work better is good, consistent, and well-coordinated political support for the people who are trying to do the work. You know, I'm, I'm sorry, poor Ashley, you know. Every, every, every time something goes wrong, people shout at him. He's not allowed to shout back at the politicians saying, well, why do you appoint these people who mess up the system and I have to come and fix it? Because he could actually say that, but he's very polite. I want to talk about this backlog, about whether we've got a problem of a backlog of services. And, I, you know, I, I've, I've written this publicly, so I just want to use the opportunity to present it here. Just to give you an, ex an idea about what's happened since 1994 with water supply in South Africa. Because I came back from Mozambique in 1988. I was slightly ahead of time. I was uh, <coughs> deployed by certain parties, but we won't go there. And they said, in 1988, it's probably a good time to come back to South Africa, which you might think strange, because lots of people thought South Africa wasn't on a good path. But actually, it was quite clear. We were headed to democracy in 1988. We just had a certain amount of fighting and arguing and, bloodshed and tears to get through. But in, 1990, in 1988, I was working at the Development Bank and tried to understand how much water people in South Africa had. Who had water, safe water, accessible water, and who didn't? And we did a lot of work as part of the preparation for democracy. And we worked out that essentially one third of, the, of South Africa did not have a safe water supply, an adequate water supply. And we said, well, there's our target. We've got to fix that. Uh, we've got to deal with that one third of the population who don't have water. And we did that, actually, because if you look at 2022, which is the year I'm using the numbers, 54 million people had had water provide, had, had safe water, okay? And there were some problems, but there was only 6 million without. But what that meant, have a look at that picture. We provided water for 30 million people, which is more than had it huh? back in the day. And that was a huge infrastructure push, which continues. 
And I'm concerned that we don't understand whether it's the flooding in Etequini or whether it's the water supply problem across the country that we are dealing with a million, a million and a half more people every year. That means that investment has to be done, the money has to be found, the infrastructure has to be built, and then it has to be operated and maintained. So take away the 10 million people, and they, a lot of them are in KwaZulu-Natal and Limpopo and Pumalanga, the rural provinces, Eastern Cape. This, we were talking about 20 million more people since 1994 have got safe and reliable water, and the concern that we should be having is for the 10 million where it's not working well, and the 6 million who still don't have any sort of infrastructure at all. Um, because that 10 million which is, has the pipes, has the water, has the pumps, but it's not working, or it's not working reliably, or it's not working safely, those are the ones we ought to be really getting back to work. Because we've made the investment, we must make sure it works. But just to move on, because we're talking about the root causes. The other root cause that we have for water failures is we plan, we do some very good plans. I was on the planning commission, we did a lot of planning in the Department of Water and, and Water Affairs when I was there, and those plans are there. But what, when you've got a problem, you've got to plan, decide what needs to be done, and then do it. And do it on time and do it properly. So in 2005, Nelson Mandela Bay had this program, and Ashley knows about this. Um, there was a master plan. One of the things it said is, build Nuit Kadach. What are they doing? They're building Nuit Gedacht in 2023. Well, you know, don't be surprised then if between 20, 2005 and 2023 you have some problems. If you don't do what's necessary at the right time, you will have a problem. And, you know, so there's no shortage of water for Nelson Mandela Bay. The works necessary to bring the water to Nelson Mandela Bay and distribute it through Nelson Mandela Bay is the problem. The plan to deal with that was done in 2005. Why didn't we do it before? And, you know, this is where I do have to ask the question, and it's political leadership. And, of course, if we look at Nelson Mandela Bay, which political leadership? You know, the ANC was there, but there have been quite a few other parties there. And, actually, it's a political class that has to learn to work together with apologies. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm old enough, I'm, I'm out of it, no one can, can uh, sanction me anymore. But, really, the political class needs to work, learn to work together across political boundaries where necessary. And I do recall that in KZN, even in my time, um, which is why the Honourable Singh invited me, because we used to get on very well together, although he knew perfectly well I came from an ANC deployment process, which was, I phoned up Kaida Asmal and said, I want to come and work for water, and he asked, who's this Miller? And, and somebody in the ANC said, oh, it's okay, we know him, he can come and work. That was how the deployment worked in 1994. But I do think we have to now build in a very structured way work and cooperation across party lines to do the important jobs like providing water. Okay. And if the Konrad Adendauer Foundation supports me too, they've got experience of coalition politics in Germany, so they know about it as well. Um, we were asking about the state of disaster. Do regulations make a difference? And I'm answering your questions because I think it's important. Regulations can make a difference, but you've got to actually do the right kind of regulation. You've got to make sure it works, and then you've got to implement it. And one of the problems we have with water supply across our municipalities is on the one hand, we have a policy which says free basic water. No one must go without water uh, enough to survive by. Now that actually we have to do, by the way, because the Sustainable Development Goal 6.1, 6.2 says by 2030 everyone in the world should have access to safe water, enough and affordable. And then we have to ask the question, okay, I'm an engineer, I can make it safe. I can bring it to your house. How can I make sure that you can afford it? And that for South Africa is the real problem because South Africa is the most unequal country in the world, according to most of the measures that I've looked at. And I hate to have to say this, but you know, I checked the, 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 uh, the tables, they all say this. 
And what that means is although we've got some very nice places, we've got some very rich people, we've, a lot of us work, live quite comfortably, comparatively, there are millions of people in South Africa who wake up in the morning and are not sure whether they have enough money to have food that day. Now to go and ask those people to pay for water as well, you've got to choose between food which you can't just go and find somewhere, unless you jump a fence or two, but then you can also get into trouble, or you go and take dirty water from a source that's un, un, unsafe and impure. And too often people are actually making that choice. Now the, the free basic water regulations were saying <coughs> indigent people who can't afford water must get water for free. Good. But who are these indigent people? They're the people who go through the, the, all the processes and they get themselves registered and they signed up and somebody goes and checks and if, if they don't have the right friend in the office they still don't get registered as indigents. And what we find is that, and I've, these are figures from Stats SA so I trust them, about 2020, 2021 I think, it was just before COVID so it must have been the 2020 reports. They found that 16% of, of South African households get and are registered as indigents to get free basic water. We then asked Stats SA the other question, how many people in South Africa pay for water? And they said only 45% of households pay for water. <laughs> so 16% of people are indigents, but 55% of people don't pay for water. Now, how, does the, how do we pay for free basic water? We use the equitable share, which was talked about, which puts some money in the municipal budget to pay for that free basic water, but it only pays for less than half of the people, particularly in the poor rural municipalities, who need it. So we have a very clever policy which says, we are going to meet SDG 6.1 because we have free basic water. And we're going to put some money in the pot for the municipalities to give that free basic water. But when you scratch at the policy, you find it's only giving water, money for less than half, probably a third of the people who need it. Now we really have a problem. Because how are the municipalities going to give free basic water to people who are not registered as indigent, but really probably ought to get that free basic water? And the answer is partly, well, uh, we'll just turn a blind eye, and you'll have big houses built in traditional areas which are connected to water pipes. They're not paying anything, they're not built, the meters are not read. Uh -huh. And that applies all the way through the communities. Uh, so a lot of people are taking water, they probably should pay, but they don't pay because no one is checking whether they actually have been metered and whether they're using. So, I just wanted to draw that to your attention because here you have a good regulatory system but it hasn't been thought through. So half the people who should be benefiting aren't benefiting. We haven't told the municipalities how to deal with things. We're now expecting municipalities who anyway don't collect money to spend even more money on maintenance for people who should be contributing to that maintenance. Now we, we begin to see that we are through our regulatory approach not being very consistent and coherent and we're actually causing some difficulties. And this is why the sort of change over that is being proposed, you heard from Mr. Starkey, uh, is, is quite important because we have to start focusing much more carefully on who gets what money to do what in the water supply business. Now I want to just go very quickly. We do have a problem though in terms of water and uh, we, we need a bit of course correction. What are the root causes? I was asked to talk about root causes. I want to say, and I don't, uh, maybe I should ask this question so I can work out how to get out of the door safely. How many municipal councillors are there here? <laughs> Could I have a hand for any municipal councillor? Because I'm going to say rude things about municipalities. Okay, at least one. Okay. And they're sitting near the door, so I better be careful. <laughs> um, you know, I think that municipalities have too much impunity. We talk about impunity for corruption, but we also have impunity for municipalities who don't do their jobs. Uh -huh. Because when somebody comes from national and says, you're not doing your job, we even come from province, you're not doing your job, they say, well, go to the constitution, here's the procedure. 
I can't remember the clause number. Fortunately, I'm not coming into Parliament anymore, so I don't have to turn the pages. But you know, in the Constitution, the procedure to intervene in a municipality is not easy. And first the province has to do it, and then the, the national does it, and then they've got to report back to Parliament. It's not serious. You cannot try and solve a big problem like a municipal water supply that has failed, which is going to take five years to fix in one or two months and reporting back to Parliament and reporting back everywhere every two or three months. We have to make some changes in that municipality, in that impunity and the extreme autonomy of municipalities. You know, we always talk about the sunset clause being the clause which gave uh, white officials their permanent jobs and their permanent pensions, and it was a sunset clause. They wouldn't have agreed to the transition if they hadn't got some guarantees. But actually the most dangerous sunset clause was the one which said municipalities are going to be very autonomous. They're going to be protected from national government interference. And we know why that happened, because in lots of parts of the country, whether it was people who wanted a border start, or whether it was traditional leadership in places like KZN wanting to be protected from a national government that would want to come and push them out, we gave this very strong autonomy to local institutions. And now we find, we, even if everyone agrees it's going wrong, we're not allowed to go and fix it, because we've got this little constitution, which is a great constitution, but it has got some limitations to it which need to be addressed. So I do raise this question of municipal impunity and extreme autonomy uh, as being barriers. And as uh, Ashley has said, there are proposals to get around that, but we really need to understand the importance of allowing national and provincial government to be able to intervene more effectively when municipalities really fail, because otherwise we're failing people. And our job as municipalities and as government should be to support people, not to protect the institution when it doesn't do its job of, uh, of serving the people. And intervention needs not just the right people with the money, but the conditions to, which allow them to do the work. So we have actually some good technical skills. You know, everyone was worried about this, the government was going to lose skills. And I'm happy to say, because I work with the professional engineering associations, we've got quite a lot of good young professionals. Any good young professional engineer would like to put up their hand here? Have we got any young engineers here? Uh, uh, you're going to have to recruit more from the professional side, honorable president. Um, but let's be clear that we have good people able and willing to learn and do the job, but they need to be employed. And again, this is a political responsibility. In the end, the recruitment procedures in municipalities, provinces, and national government, in the end, the, the environment for recruitment is created by the political level. And we really need to fix that because we're not getting the people we need into the system to do the work that needs to be done. The last area, I'll be very quick, private sector. Can it be a role player? Well, we've already heard it actually can be. It is. A lot of, a lot of work is being done, and fortunately, Ashley has pr uh, presented quite a few of those. Whether it's in developing big water projects, whether it's in fixing leaks in municipal water systems, we have lots of examples of the private and the public sector working together to uh, serve the people's water and sanitation needs better. But I think the lesson that comes out of it, and I think Ashley showed that slide which said that in a lot of the big water pr uh, projects, 60% of the money is coming from the private sector. Banks, mines, Sassel and Eskom, people like that. One of the good things that we found about those projects is that if you're sharing the responsibility for the project, you can't just give it to a procurement committee where your friend is the chair of the, of, of, of the committee and they'll award the tender to the people that you want it to be because you've got people from the banks and, and the big clients sitting there. They also want to see where their money is going. And so we find that when you get the proper partnership, a respectful partnership between government and private, we get very good results. And if you go down, you know, to, I always use the Berg River uh, Dam in Cape Town which was built with, by the TCTA, 
Trans-Caledon Tunnel Authority. It was their first project, which wasn't a Lesotho project-based uh, uh, activity. They went to the city of Cape Town, said, we want to get private funds to build your new dam. City of Cape Town says, well, we're not sure that we want to do this because we don't trust you. TCTA went and found lenders, a consortium of lenders, who would lend the money on condition that the job was done properly. Finally, it took about a year's worth of negotiation. They agreed. Berg River Dam was built. If it hadn't been for the Berg River Dam, if you think day zero was bad, it would have been really, it would have been day double zero. Okay. Um, but it was built well, quickly, on time, on budget, because the private sector, the client, which was the city of Cape Town, and the promoter, which was the Department of Water and Sanitation, had to work together looking over each other's shoulders and agreeing on each step of the way. So getting that partnership between, the, between government and business and a respectful partnership, not a partnership which says, come in together and uh, yes, we, we, we'll approve your proposal as long as we get 30%. Uh-uh. That's not how it works. And we really need to get past that 30% is just what you pay us for being given the job to 30% if you're going to contribute 30%, 30% is what you should have with our support. But it's to do the job, not just to take the money. Um, and since we mentioned desalination, there's lots of opportunities for PPPs. I know people have just talked about uh, desalination, taking seawater and turning it into drinking water. It's very easy to do. It just costs a lot of money. The cost of the energy, which used to be the big problem, is coming down because we can just have solar power. The cost of the plant, where you use that energy to take the salt out of the water, is very high. And I did this some years ago, so the figures might have changed, but essentially I was looking at the Australian case because they also had a, a, a day zero problem in Australia. They also panicked and started building desalination plants. They found, in this case in Sydney, they used it in the first 132 months, which I think is 11 years, they used it for five months. Despite that, they were having to pay just the standby costs for each household a thousand rand, and this is old rand, so it was a lot of money back then. Um, the point is, you can have desal. It is certainly, if you live near the coast, there's no reason to run out of water as long as you don't run out of money. But it's the kind of thing that if you talk to the private sector and get them to compete with each other, you can get some very good deals, you can solve a particular problem, but it requires a partnership, a respectful partnership between a private sector and a government, and it also requires commitment and people need to trust that if a government commits to pay for the next 10 years at a certain rate, they will carry on paying. And of course that is always a bit of a problem because uh, you know, there's history in some cases of default. Um, I think then, you know, I, I'm, I'm driven by this global sustainable development goal, 6.1, water for all. It's gotta be universal, equitable, safe, and affordable by 2030. And I don't think, by the way, that South Africa's gonna make it. I don't think we're on track. Uh, but because I work with these folk, I think this is a very good goal for us to have. And if we want to achieve that, we've really got to think hard and correct the course that we're on. And I do think it starts with recognizing that municipal autonomy and impunity has got to end. We really have to allow national and provincial to come in and fix when things go wrong. And we need to find what solutions they can bring in, but as you've heard, um, I don't know why it is that KZN, whenever there's a really big problem, you send a, a, a minister in, you know, to the ANC government. So, so first it was DPSA, you send, uh, send some Kunu in there, and then, you know, then they've decided water is a problem, so he's been transferred from DPSA to water. I have to say that the, the course that he's charted, which you've seen some of the presentation of, if it's allowed to proceed, has got a good chance of succeeding. Um, but it's gonna require support from all of society. It can't just come from one party. And it's actually really important that it gets support from an IFP 
as well as all the other parties, and it does, isn't seen simply as a one-party intervention. Um, because, as I said before, and I'm just repeating myself, to be successful in the water business, to achieve water for all, we need the right people. Actually, actually, there's a whole lot of young ones, you know, but, you know, Ashley used to be a young one when I was a DG. Um, <laughs> uh, there are people. We are training people. There are very good people. And this is what I'm talking about, black South Africans. It's no longer old, white-haired, white South Africans. Um, we need to get those people. But they must have the funds to do the job, and they must be allowed to do the job by the political leadership. And so the political job, the, your real task, is to create the conditions in which we can allow our real technical capabilities to be unlocked and let them shine. And then we'll find that perhaps we achieved with the goal we want. You see, this is the danger, Member Singh. If you invite me to come and talk to a political meeting, I'm now free to talk to the politicians. That's your fault, you know. <laughs> You've got to do your job better. And it really is quite a serious message. At the moment, we're in a position where politicians have got to create conditions to allow us as technicians, because I'm a technician, to do our job. And if you can do that, I think we can transform South Africa and we may even achieve that goal, uh, 6.1. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, Professor Muller. Um, you know, one of the fascinating things about this uh, conference is that you get diverse voices. Uh, I enjoyed the, 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 <laughs> the provocation. <laughs> um, yeah, because I, I, I hate creating zombies, uh, Mr. Kass. I, I hate. Uh, I always tell those who are, who are close to me to say, I hate to create leaders who are zombies. People must be free to express themselves, even if we have nurtured them. You know, even if, yeah, because you will not grow. I was, I was very happy. Um, yeah, poor management, poor settlement planning. Some of these problems, we create themselves as candidate. Um you know, when you talk about water and poor settlement planning, Prof, I'm reminded of this program of the EFF of land invasions, which creates shacks everywhere, as if, Tina, we are, we are not the dignity of citizens. How, how do you the achievement of the queen? But can you call up? Uh, it's cut is exactly uh, half past 12, half past 11. We will break for tea now for ex exactly 15 minutes. Uh, we come back at Cora 2 while my panel is uh, 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 preparing themselves. You will first, for the first 10 minutes, talk to each other. Uh, and then after that, we'll take questions from the, from the uh, delegates and then we we'll close. Uh, yeah, can we then break now for for, tea, for exactly 15 minutes? But let us allow leadership first to go and take it on. It, 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 it's just protocol. I see, I see Animal Farm. It's just protocol.
panelists. We have to be at lunch by 12.30, otherwise we don't get lunch. So, uh, so moderator, I'm just uh, giving you that. Sir. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I've been accused at TG during tea break that we are making this too serious. <laughs> uh, yeah. So they want me to say, Waba biza bonkushingi, Waba keli nganawe, Wati nangungucha, Angi nangucha, Wasi biza sonkushingi, Wasa keli nganawe, Wati nangungucha, Ungi nangucha, Aungena, Aungya pimp, Aungena, 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 Thank you. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. I will first uh, give my panel for the next. Uh, I know ten minutes is not it's not uh, fair, but because of time, um, I think I want to save you, Mister. Uh, because I, the professors, you. Uh, but it was good. It was professor to pro, a professional to a professional. Uh, I will. I will. I will. I will, I will, I will want you, Mr. Starkey, to, to, to wrap up. Uh, I will first, I don't know whether you are still uh, connected, uh, Dr. Tatton. I would let Pan Sumzal. Yes, I am. Oh, you are. Oh, thank you very much. Um, can you have the first shot in the next two minutes, please? But yes, wait for all means. Uh, yes, just two means, minutes. Uh, I'll, I'll, yeah. Yeah, by all means. Okay. I, I just would like to note that uh, I was invited to offer my professional opinion to the IF. Do as a professional. I did not take any personal swipes at any individual. I did not make any disparaging remarks about anyone's integrity. And um, my advice to you is what my advice to you is. I'm not making any money from any of you. I've got no vested interest. So I'd just like to say that I keep it professional as a professional. There were, some, there were two things said about me that I would just like to, like to correct if I might. Uh, the one was uh, the notion of water war. Uh, if anyone knows anything about my professional life, you'll know that I've been strongly of the opinion that the war of the next century will not be over water. So I've always been in the anti-water war side. So that allegation is incorrect. It's, uh, it's, it's designed to try and, and neutralize my voice. It's, it's, it's part of, a, of an ongoing program that I've lived with for many, many years. And the second thing, that issue about acid mine drainage, I've worked a lot on acid mine drainage, and the allegation that I said that that, that this, that the uh, Buildings would fall down. I never said that. A journalist said that. A journalist said that to sensationalise the story. That journalist was uh, was censured, was uh, was disciplined by uh, you know by the professional uh, bodies that manage journalists. And uh, the journalist happened to use my name somewhere in there, but I didn't say those things. Those two things that are that are, that have been alleged that I said are, are entirely untrue. But I'm not going to get involved in a mudslinging lash match because I'm a professional person and I respect the, uh, the IP. They've asked me for my opinion. I've given them my opinion. I stand by every word that I've said. And, uh, you know, if there's anything that I can do to assist in the future, I will gladly do so because all that I want is for a successful, democratic South Africa in which all can reach their full potential and in which we can all prosper and we can all get on with our lives. And for that, we need healthy political parties and for that we need a healthy government. And uh, therefore, you know, the IFP, in my view, plays an important role. That is my position on the matter. I don't want to get involved in any more mudslinging. So I, I consider that to be unprofessional. So thank you very much. I wish you all well in your in your future endeavours. 
And I think your task is a noble one. Go into the future with confidence. I believe that the time for the IFP is still coming. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Dutton. Please don't, don't switch off because there will be questions from the audience. Can I give you Dr. Uh, Professor Munda? <clears throat> Yeah, uh, you know, I'm not sure that I want to ask questions of the panel. I would re much rather hear from the audience what lack of clarity, because I know I talk a fast and I talk a lot, where there's lack of clarity, where we need to take things further. I think in the course of that, for instance, about the cholera, for instance, about the cause of breakdowns in municipalities. There are some things where we have actually not always agreed between the three of us, but let's hear that raised perhaps from the floor. Um, and I'm sorry, <laughs> Honorable Singh, you know, I, I, I'm a disruptor. I do think that might be actually more useful. I, I would really like to hear what people took and are confused about or feel strongly about from the audience side than necessarily to pose my own questions because I'm interested in lots of things but I'm not sure the audience is in what I'm interested in. So that's a suggestion. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> so in terms of the perspective I presented uh, to you today was setting the scene in terms of what is the status in the water sector and that's what I presented to you. Um, So, okay, can I conclude? So, so there's a good example of uh, operations and maintenance. Eh? So, so on the point of vandalism, we, and, and if you ask us as a, as a department, this is something that we really need your support on. Finally, lives are being lost. Let me stop there. If, if I can, having said, I'd like to hear from the audience. Um, just between the one area where uh, uh, Dr. Turton and, uh, and Ashley agree, and I agree as well, is that vandalism is actually undermining huge amounts of our public activity. And it scares me when we start talking, and I'm hearing this in some places, it's called infrastructure harvesting. Mm. So you see a, a, a pipe, or you see a cable and you don't see water or electricity you see I can make 10 rand from this pipe or I can make a hundred rand from this cable I'm going to cut it and sell it and I'm afraid that and this is one of these challenges of inequality in South Africa if you've got very very poor people who don't know where they're going to eat what they're going to eat never mind pay for water harvesting infrastructure we call it vandalism if now it's been used in a number of places, if it is used and sold because people are trying to subsist, we have a very serious social problem. And so your next meeting, I'm afraid, is going to have to be about welfare policy. Because unless you make sure that people can eat, people will steal railway lines, will steal pipes, will steal cables. Because that's the only way they can eat. And that is very scary in South Africa in 2023. So I just wanted to put that on the table squarely. Thank you very much. I, I, I'm very happy uh, that uh, professor, the professors are now agreeing on this vandalism. <laughs> they are agreeing. Yeah. Um, without wasting time, I think you have taken notes. I'm ready to take five hands for the first round. Uh, Honorable DP, Honorable Alderman, Makuchwa, 
Nzigi and Tumi. Seven in Five. In the thirty-second round. In that order, Honorable TP. Uh, thank you, uh, Comrade uh, Moderator Lamin, and greetings to the President of the party and the leadership collectively and all present. I just have one clarity second question to Professor Muller. And I like the fact that you said you are now speaking freely to politicians because you no longer working very close with them. And I believe that I will take from the same tune that I will speak freely to you. You spoke about the challenges faced by municipalities uh, and the difficulty in intervening because of their autonomous nature, which we believe. And you further said that uh, this autonomous is a result of the sunset clauses because the white couldn't agree to get into any settlement without these clauses. And we didn't end there, which is where my clarity uh, second question is. You further made reference now to traditional leaders in relation to land issues, claiming that there were also some sunset clauses which were made. And I want you to come out very clear as to what you mean here, because to me it sounded like this nonsensical lie, which is peddled by educated fools, that suggests that the consolidation of the land that belongs to Amakosi through Nguyama Trust was a, some sort of a settlement agreement between the founder of this party and Mr. De Klerk, which is very nonsensical. So what do you exactly mean by making reference to Amakosi in relation to sunset clauses? Uh, number two. Oh, oh yeah. Aldama. <laughs> oh yeah. No, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Honorable uh, Moderator Comrade Bonginkosi Lamini, the Honorable President of our party, our, the Honorable Deputy President of our party, and and colleagues without any waste of time. Uh, much ha has been said about the, the sabotage of the infrastructure by a certain people who want to benefit. Um, I just wanted to find out, you know, in our days and age where we, we invest so much in the technology, uh, I know, for instance, that there is a tool with, with regards to the cable theft that you can just put there as, uh, as soon as the, somebody is trying to steal a, a cable, it can immediately report um, that part particular incident, whether we can't really invest on that technology because relying on security alone <coughs> may not be, ne be sufficient at this day and time. I think secondly, what the, the mistakes that is done by municipalities <coughs> is that they don't invest much on maintenance on the infrastructure where, because the pipe that was made to, to supply water to 100,000 people, that population has since grown to double the population, but the pipe has not been upgraded. And, and as a result, <coughs> you, you, you'll get that sewer spillage you'll get all these challenges that are faced by people and not enough water, not enough pressure has been supplied to our people. I think we need to, as a, as a population grows, municipalities has to uh, invest uh, of, of in, in upgrading of, of those uh, pipes, infrastructure in particular, to ensure that it, it does uh, give uh, adequate services to our people. I thank you. Thank you. Number three. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Comrade uh, Lamini. Uh, greetings to our uh, to our honourable president. 
uh, the deputy president, uh, the caucus members present here, and uh, all comrades. Uh, mine will be very short, uh, Chairperson. I wanted to check you know, with our panelists. We have heard that uh, from the presentation, billions of rands are being spent uh, on surface water projects. Uh, and we know that 60% you know, comes from private sector. That was from the presentation. And uh, what I want to find out is that in terms of percentage, you know, how much is being spent on desalination? Uh, because I want to agree with uh, Dr. Fitton that uh, indeed, uh, at this day and age, you know, desalination has uh, increasingly uh, declined in terms of how it's implemented, you know, uh, monetary. So, uh, and I believe that, you know, that's the solution, you know, that we can uh, apply, you know, uh, if we're a water scarce uh, country. Uh, secondly, uh, most of the water that we are consuming comes from uh, rain. And I believe rain is free for everyone. So, by extension, water should also be free. Uh, we understand that uh, the cost comes from uh, purifying and uh, maybe translocating water. Uh, but then my question is, what gives municipalities uh, a right to, uh, to meter the privately built boreholes? I'm, I'm, I'm talking this from experience, you know. Uh, in my hometown, Pongola, you know, the municipality demanded to put a meter on the pothole, you know, that I've uh, constructed myself. You know, I've incurred, you know, the cost of uh, drilling that pothole, but now uh, they want to meter that, you know. So uh, how do I pay uh, a service, you know, not rendered, you know, because I've done it myself. Uh, thirdly, uh, on this one, moderator, you will help me, you know, because I don't want to find myself uh, in trouble, you know, for... Uh, not not representing you know the policy of the party well, but you know it's on vandalism, uh, uh, and I will uh, I will want to check if uh, what if we build you know a, a capable state in uh, with capacity so that we don't uh, over rely you know on these private uh, participants you know, uh, and uh, I'm not in any way, you know, uh, faulting the 30%, you know, the preferential procurement policy framework, you know, in fact, uh, it is there, you know, and it is benefiting most of us, you know, however, uh, I think the over-reliance on these uh, private uh, companies, you know, to do the work, you know, maybe uh, uh, it is the cause of these uh, support touches that we see. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, number four. Uh, thank you, thank you, sir. Being a little power attention, let me say uh, all protocol observed. Um, the one thing that came out of uh, of a presentation here today is from uh, Dr. Anthony Tatum when he mentioned Indabaye accountability and uh, consequences, which seems to be a problem in a lot of uh, SOEs. Uh, if I may ask uh, you, uh, Mr. Starkey. For, for starters, we have seen in the instance of a uh, rode plant dam being infested with uh, plant uh, colonies and uh, the Royval water, water treatment plant also not being maintained. And we know for a fact that there was contracts issued for those, uh, uh, for those plants to be maintained, but the service was never provided. As the Department of Water and Sanitation, um, I would like to ask what... what uh, what contingency plans, what, uh, what is the steps that you are taking in addressing all of these issues, in, including the, the issue of, uh, of the sewage uh, flows and uh, the effects of uh, illegal mining into our water systems? What is the Department of Water and Sanitation doing to mitigate these issues? Thank you. Thank you. Number five. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, I'd like to greet the house at large. Um, I think I'm just going to add on to the last point that my colleague was asking here, is that as much as we say we are a water scarce country, however, are we doing enough to protect the little that we do have? Um, I, t I wanted to go back to what he just spoke about now in terms of the effects and the contamination uh, of water as a result of things like your illegal mining. 
it's a it's a it's a big issue right now uh, that I feel is not really being addressed. Are we are wait are we really waiting to be reactive rather than being proactive at the moment? Thank you very much. Thank you. <coughs> Those are the uh, five questions. Maybe to add. You know, I, I made a mistake, uh, TG. I visited this plant where they take sewer and clean the water. Hey, you take time to drink tap water after seeing that thing. <laughs> well, how secure and how clean is this recycling of sewer water to be reconsumed, to be reconsumed again? <laughs> yeah. uh, over to you. There was a, a direct question to you, uh, Dr. T uh, Tatton, from... You please unmute. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank, you. thank you. I've made notes of the, of the questions, and I'll just quickly respond. Um, the first question was about technology. I think you know South Africa is still a developing country, and I don't think we must necessarily fall in love with modern technology and think that modern technology is just the solution to all of our problems. I would like to suggest that one of our most potent forms of solution is our traditional knowledge and traditional customs. I would like to say that the Amakosi know. The Amakosi are a very powerful uh, body of authority that exists out there. They know what's going on in their communities, and I think that's probably one of your single most important lines of, uh, of defense against uh, sabotage and against uh, destruction of infrastructure for commercial purposes. So I would like to, if anything, call for a rekindling of the, of the, of the importance of the Amakosi and the role that they play uh, in terms of, of traditional uh, lawmaking and, and, and law application in South Africa within the framework of a modern constitution, which, uh, which of course, is entitled to do in, in, in the South African constitution. The second thing I'd just like to just comment on this desalination thing. There's a lot of energy, there's a lot of, when I say energy, I'm talking about emotional energy that's gone into desalination. The simple reality of, of the situation is that South Africa, uh, in the 2002 National Water Resource Strategy, we, we'd allocated 98% of all the water we have available. I'm not going to go into all the numbers now, but, but we are fundamentally a water-constrained economy. And the simple reality is that all the coastal cities in South Africa are fundamentally water-constrained. I'm just going to just, just mention two things about desalination that are important. The first thing is that I'm working at the moment a lot in the Middle East, and the Middle East and the Saudis have got a very interesting uh, uh, idea. The Saudis are saying, because, because in, in, in Islam, they also have a, tra a similar tradition to an African cultural tradition where, where, where water is a gift from, from God or a gift from Allah in their case, and, the, and therefore it may not be sold, it may not be, you know, be bought or sold. So they've got a new, a new concept now. They're, they're saying that that uh, we must start, get away from the model of having to uh, desalinate seawater at great cost and, uh, and then sell this uh, to an unwilling uh, a market that's not willing to pay for it. And they said, what we must rather do is think about this uh, desalination thing as concentrating salt. So we're not, we're not removing, uh, we're not uh, producing water, we are concentrating salt and we are selling on those chemically pure uh, uh, substances that you find in the, in, in, in the salt. So their business model now is about the salt, concentration of salt. And the byproduct, the waste product that comes from that is perfectly clean drinking water. So they've now got water, perfectly clean drinking water as waste, which if someone's prepared to take it at whatever they're prepared to pay for it, that simply becomes an additional uh, 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 thing in their business plan. So it's a different way of thinking about it. And I'll just, uh, I'll just say, I'll give another one example of desalination. I was um, uh, quite involved in the, in the Cape Town Day Zero crisis. And... Um, because I've got a high media profile, I, I, I was picked up by the BBC on this thing, and the BBC broadcast an interview with me uh, all over the world, and uh, immediately I was contacted by people in Australia, and I was, uh, I was invited to uh, come and participate in a 10-year strategic um, planning session for Vic Water, the, uh, one of the big water boards uh, that's responsible for the city of Melbourne. And that was a very interesting experience for me because what I learned from that, uh, as just, just as an external third party, um, uh, uh, no, a second opinion, if you like, a third opinion, if you like, on, on what they were doing, what I learned from that is that uh, when, when uh, Melbourne went through this whole desalination crisis, they were severely criticized by South Africans. So, uh, South African political leaders criticized them a lot. And uh, however, what they did was by restoring uh, investor confidence, by, by restoring water security through desalination, uh, they, they, they restored investor confidence and capital flowed back into the city of Melbourne in an unprecedented way. 
And I would like to think that the motor car industry in Itagwini, for example, and in uh, and in uh, Port Elizabeth, East London, those, those the motor car industries there are, are, are suffering at the moment from uh, from the lack of of security, lack lack of, of water security. And I would like to think that those are probably places where you will get willing investment from those industries into the re-establishment of water security. So yeah, that's all I'd like to say. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Prof. Okay, thanks. Um, and just, just, just to say, I'm, I'm, I'm delighted that uh, the three of us, uh, Dr. Turton and Ashley and myself, agree on one thing, that actually what we need to do to address vandalism is in fact, firstly, let's mobilize communities and give communities a way of acting when they see vandalism and, and infrastructure theft, that they can report it without having consequences to themselves but they can see action happening as a result of their reports. Because at the moment we know that lots of people know what goes on, they're scared to talk about it, and therefore they don't talk about it, and therefore the vandalism and infrastructure harvesting continues. So I think at least we're all three agreed. Communities need to be mobilized and empowered to protect public infrastructure. Please, it's one of the most important things if we're going to achieve this water security. There was a very specific question which I, I need to respond to about uh, the, the, the question of sunset clauses. And I was certainly not thinking of Ingunyama Trust when we were talking about that. So let me get it clear. The first issue was, and I know this because I was engaging with the Codessa committee at the time, which was do, doing boundaries, because we wanted to fix the water management boundaries for the country, to do which we had to understand their debates about political boundaries. There was a lot of pressure to draw small municipal boundaries preferably around different groups, because in particular the rich community wanted to be a bit insulated from the poor community. And, you know, I think Hart Beersport was the case in point. It was one of those cases where, you know, eventually it became part of the Brits municipality and all the communities around. But they were convinced if they could just put their arms around this little community of very rich people, they could manage very happily but they didn't want to be part of the bigger community. So that's the kind of boundary uh, uh, issues that I was talking about. I do think, though, that there is a, a real problem with the physical planning of settlements in traditionally uh, ruled areas. And to the extent, if that involves in Gonyama Trust, I think it involves Amakosi of different kinds all through the country. I do remember, particularly in Mpumalanga, a real problem that the department had to face where 2,000 people had been encouraged by the course of, the, of, of, of that particular region to build their properties on the top of a very nice hill. And then they wanted water. The trouble was they'd been told that you see these water tanks below you. We built those tanks so they could serve people, but you've now built above them. And you, that was a lack of coordination. Plus it was the fact that one particular group stood to benefit from that land on the top and another person would benefit from the land below. And so we do need a way of mediating the, the conflicts between different traditional groups to help support better planning of service provision. Because if you're going to have to sp serve 2,000 people sitting on top of a hill by pumping all the time, their water is going to be three times more expensive. You don't want them to have to pay three times more. You haven't got the subsidy for it. And so that's what we're trying to do. Okay, so no reflections on Ingunyama Trust. I know better than to get into that fight. Okay. Um, I'm just trying to think what else uh, th that we should deal with. The, th the question of desalination is, is a very clear one, and it's been in the planning of the, of the water sector since at least 1970, the Commission for Inquiry into Water Matters, which was a very good document because even the National Party government of 1970 recognized they had better listen to the technicians for a change. They couldn't put ideology into water. And the technicians said, eventually we will be using desalination to meet the needs of the coastal cities, but at the moment it is still far too expensive. And it's been interesting watching the experiments of Nelson Mandela Bay and Cape Town and Etiquini considering desalination because it's a very easy way of getting water. It is an expensive way because those capital costs are high and we will do it when it's necessary. 
What has happened, though, is that some places have recognized, let's have a desalination plant, and this is why the Australians have actually now done quite well. Even if we only use it for 5% of the time, it does mean that we are protected against a really bad drought. And since the Australians have had even worse droughts than South Africa, they really are worried about that. And because the Australians managed to exterminate the indigenous population, and we need to remember this, they don't have a very unequal society because they actually exterminated the indigenous population They're very crudely. Um, so they've got a lot of money. They don't have to support an unequal society. In South Africa, we really have to think hard about whether we can afford to build large, expensive capital plants um, just to keep us secure if there are cheaper ways of doing that. But desal is coming, and it's interesting where it's coming most is in the holiday resorts along the coast. Because if you build a holiday resort, you know that for two months of the year you need lots of water, and for, six, for 10 months you need none. And so we see all along the coast small desalination plants for rich communities that are there for tourist purposes, and it makes perfect sense, and we must support that. But uh, it's, as has been said, technology has its place, but actually there are a lot of other issues that need to be considered. And uh, I think that we've got the right balance at the moment. But desal will come, no, no doubt. When the cost of energy drops and the processes get more efficient, we'll see more desal on a big scale in the cities uh, along the coast. Mon, thank you. So three points. Let me start uh, from the third point. Um, moderator, you asked how safe is reused water? Well, we have a plant in, in Belito, uh, it's called Fraser's. During the drought we, of 2017, it was a sewerage plant. Now all the waste was coming in and we have Caesar water that they were using pre-treated water. So before we throw it into the river, you have to pre-treat it. And so what they did, they took it one step further through an RO pro reverse osmosis process, and now they produce um, drinking portable, portable, not the water you carry, portable water, drinking water, which meets the SANS um, uh, standards. So I've drank it many times, and there's no, so we, and, and Prof can tell you that when we, when we do certify these, we make sure that it meets all. So the one, the, 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 the reuse, we, we ensure that it meets all criteria, and we provide the guidelines and norms and standards, to, and we also monitor. So uh, I'm not sure where you went, but the one I can talk about in KZD, it's just outside Belito, it's, it's quite compliant. The next question was around, um, the, the sewerage and, and our regulatory function regarding that. Now, I think you've seen in the news that Minister, recently we've, we've taken 14 municipalities, and it's not, it's not a long party line. It is non-compliant defaulting municipalities. And these, in terms, if you looked at my presentation, we are touched on the role of a water service authority and a water service provider where they have not complied with those authority functions with regards to the quality of the water, and the green drop showed the, the, sewer, the, the state of the sewer plants. So we, and then I, uh, I said to you, how, how far do we go with regards to interventions and support? At some point, we have to regulate. And this is exactly what we've done. 14, and it's in the news, I'm not mentioning any names now, but it's in the news and we've applied our regulatory role. With regards to Hammond's Kral and those others, exactly the same thing what we've done. So we're not discriminating on party lines or anything, it is based on your, your, water, your constitutional obligation and your water service authority function. The other question with regards to borehole. Now, as a South African, we need to realize that the utilization of, of groundwater we have a huge potential. However, however, and I must hasten to say this, it's got to be carefully managed because these aquifers, if we have uncontrolled uh, uh, pumping from these poreholes, because aquifers are not just on its own, they are all linked, it's a whole lot. They're even linked to your, 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 your wetlands and so forth. So hence, one of the things we do, we, we have a, data, a borehole database. In instances, we charge for the abstraction for that borehole in some instances where I give you a license or a general authorization. And we need to know how much water is being, is being taken from the system. Otherwise, we would not know uh, where, how much, and even if a borehole has collapsed or not functional. So these are the reasons why 
a part of our regulatory function is to, to, to ensure that we know where the boreholes, how many are there, because many people go drill boreholes, dry up an aquifer, and then for it to take to recover takes quite a while. Okay, thank you. Do we go now? Yes, Professor. Okay. Can I just add on the borehole question, because we do have the advantage of the international experience. And if you go to a country like India, where the farmers particularly use a lot of water from boreholes for their fields, what we found, and it became a, a national scandal, is that people would drill a borehole, they would irrigate their half hectare of rice, they would make a lot of money, or enough money to be able to feed the family and go to school, and then their neighbor would drill another borehole which would go deeper. And suddenly, this farmer who had been doing very well, his borehole would dry up, and now the family would be destitute. And what started to happen across India was that each farmer used to drill a deeper borehole. They were fighting with each other to go and drill a deeper borehole than the neighbor. And then if you couldn't afford it, what did you do? You'd borrowed all the money to drill a deeper borehole, and now you couldn't pay the money back. And there was a whole series of suicides by Indian farmers who had lost all their money trying to have this borehole race. Could we dig a deeper borehole? And so if you think that what Ashley is saying is, is theory, it's actually practice. When you saw the Indian national newspapers talking about the scourge of farmer suicide caused by borehole competition, then you actually understand that this can become quite serious. I don't think we'll ever get to that stage because we're not as dependent on groundwater. But it was a very useful experience to learn from. We should always learn from other people's problems and mistakes and try to avoid repeating them. And India certainly demonstrated if you don't manage and keep oversight of your boreholes, you can in the end have social collapse because of that. So I just wanted to reinforce Ashley's Thank point. You. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. I, I think yeah, the question has been covered, but because we still have some time, I'll take the second round. Abaso, Ramakwaba, Mitanambali, Enda, Ningaki. Oh, Pungan, Kosiasis. Last one, a book in Agalab. In that order, can I have the mic there? I don't think he's got a rally, a shop steward voice. Know, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, thank you very much, Chair. Um, don't remind me the day when we went to Power FM with the Comrades course and, <laughs> and the listeners were saying there are two ladies of the IFP on the radio. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, thank you very much, Chair. Uh, greetings to yourself, to the panelists, the Honorable President, um, the Chief Whip, the Caucus Chairperson, uh, the Deputy President, and all the colleagues um, that are part of the session. Um, Chair, I, it will be clarity-seeking comments in a way, but more of, of comments. Um, safe to say that, you know, I, I am one person who does not believe that South Africa is a water-scarce country. Uh, I don't believe there's a sh shortage of water in the country. Because I do not think that you have done a thorough assessment or an audit on the water that we have um, in the country. Um, if you look at your underground water that we have, the surface water, the water that is already on the reservoirs um, and the ocean. Uh, so I think that water is sufficient, um, you know, um, to carry. Uh, the country forward um, for many more years to come. Um, and that in, with the desalination, uh, I think there is no political will. Um, and and there's just the facts. Uh, I mean, there are over 20 countries now um, that have desalination plants. Um, and some of those countries, um, you know, they have uh, less GDP than ours. So we can't really say it's expensive for South Africa. Um, you know, if we are really fair um, to our own citizens. I mean, in Morocco, for example, 
they are using it for irrigation um, 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 uh, on, in agriculture sector. So why can't we, we apply the same methods, for example? Uh, so I'm making that as an example in Morocco. I mean, uh, we can't be beaten by Morocco um, on the desalination as South Africa, if we are really fair. So I'm, I'm saying there is no political will, and we need to be honest with ourselves. Um, and I would also like to touch on the, on the part of the infrastructure vandalism and the decaying of, of infrastructure. And to say, I think for me, the gap that we need to close is the role of the provincial government in the water supply. Uh, because it's silent. You know, we don't know what is the role of the provincial government. National government will regulate, allocate budget. Is the budget sufficient for municipalities to maintain its existing infrastructure? And the answer is no. It's not sufficient. You know, putting aside issues of vandalism, it's not sufficient. So when you do your own planning, where you then have to be required to, to upgrade your infrastructure, then the municipality will be compelled to rechannel all those uh, 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 funds um, into, into upgrading of that particular infrastructure. And when you upgrade into a particular section of the municipality, then the other section then feels neglected because the entire budget has been taken. I'll make an example in Johannesburg. You, there are no development in Region G or Orange Farm side because there is no capacity. When are, we going to upgrade, when are we going to upgrade the capacity? We do not know because we are using the budget to, to try and, 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 and maintain the existing infrastructure. And why is that? It's because we are not receiving sufficient grants from national and provincial government. And that is the problem in the municipalities. That we'll need to address. So before we say municipalities are failing to maintain and manage their own infrastructure. And that is the problem. And, and I think that if provincial government will be given a certain role in water supply and, and, and the maintenance of infrastructure, then I think maybe that resources that is sitting with the provincial government might be able to augment what the national government is providing to local municipalities. Because you cannot really say municipalities should rely on what they are receiving um, you know, as, 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 as like in, in terms of revenue. Because we, we've got a lot of indigent uh, households uh, within the municipalities. Is the database managed properly? No. And the problem is because of the regulations of the national government. So everything goes back to the national government and how they are regulating, which makes it impossible for municipalities to manage you know, certain systems and, 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 and databases as the municipalities. So I think I will end, I will end um, with the question uh, to say, with all the challenges that we have, especially with, with our um, surface water. Is internationalization of all the dams a solution in the country? And I'm saying that because government owns, I think there are around 600 dams that are owned by government, but there are more than 4,000 that are privately owned. And some of the municipalities are actually buying water from the privately owned dams. So shouldn't we continue to allow for the privatization of water, or we should nationalize water. Thank you very much. Uh, number three. Um, thank you. I'm worried about that corner. It's becoming radical. This nationalization, <laughs> this privatization. <laughs> <laughs> that corner worries me. <laughs> Um, there's no progress, there's radicalism there. It was, I was a shop steward at some point, <laughs> I think. <laughs> um, thank you so much to our moderator, Honorable Lamini. Um, greetings to our president, Ngoja, our deputy president, members of parliament present, uh, members of the NEC, um, provincial leaders, district leaders, and all protocols observed. Um, for the benefits of those who do not know me, my name is Dumi Ramakwaba. I'm from Wood. Um, my question is, um, from a systematic or regulatory point of view in terms of uh, the provision of water in this country, are there any systems or controls that speaks to, um, to find out collaboration and synergies within the different departments. 
And I'm saying this because um, I think it was Prof. Muller that uh, spoke about classical examples or typical ex examples of what could go wrong if there are no synergies um, within this department. Classical example, um, Honorable Lamini, you mentioned um, how the EFF in Niger's abandoned land and an end, and that leads to um, the Department of Human Settlements not to be able to take control and plan for that particular department. Prof. Mala, you um, spoke about um, the outbreak of diseases. And so the synergies I'm asking about is that, are there any systems and controls to say, the Department of Health, let's come and sit down and let's look at what do we do when there's a disease outbreak or what are, what are the risk mitigation strategies that we could implement um, to prevent or when there is a, um, uh, an outbreak of an epidemic, how do we then plan for that? Are there any systems and controls from a systematic and regulatory point of view to say how do we then plan and sit down and engage each other in terms of controlling um, any catastrophic um, event that could occur? And then my other question, is on, um, I think it was Ashley, you, you, when you were talking about partnerships. And the emphasis was merely on um, the, the triple Ps. But, and, and only when you mentioned the NGO, and I'll tell you why I mentioned the NGO aspect or the NGO sector. And you only mentioned the NGO, sorry, the private um, sector, only when you were talking about funding and planning for infrastructure. But you did not mention, I'll make an example of a gift of the givers. When there's a catastrophic event in this country or an epidemic, we see a lot of NGOs coming into play. The Water Crisis Committee coming into play. And why are we not emphasizing on that sort of partnership um, and to make you know, that stakeholder engagement to be more um, vigorous for a lack of a better word? The last question is on climate change. Um, Prof. Mala, you, uh, you, you were talking about how it is important to plan efficiently um, and execute on that planning on a t in a timely manner. We are aware that um, we are on the verge of um, climate change globally. It's not affecting South Africa only. And we are at a disadvantage because we are an inland country or a landlocked country mostly. So how, is there any planning that um, we are, or that is on the cards, or that we are currently talking about. I came across a scholastic article that said, by the year 2050, this country, South Africa, will experience uh, water shortages, and it will be as a result of climate change. Are there any plans um, from a World Health Organization point of view, from a UN point, uh, sorry, from a UN point of view, to say, are we planning for such events if they ever come? Thank you. Thank you. Greetings to the house at large. Um, greetings to our president and all protocol observed. So my question is like a comment also. So my name is Malin Lovu. I'm from Ward 40. I'm 22 years of age. For the past, let me say for the past 15 years, I've seen nothing but running water in the streets. I've had the privilege of running tap water in the house, but when I go home to Limbobo, there's water shortages. Another thing is we need to use the water from the rain. We don't have proper drainage systems in our community. When it rains, some people's houses get flooded because there are no proper drainage systems. So my question is, if every day we lose seven million liters of water through water leakages, how, why, why isn't the government putting strategies to reduce the water leakages instead of build, building plants for water? I think that's an even better solution. If we can fix the leakages, we can save more water instead of spending more. Our people are suffering and there's someone benefiting from all of this destruction. So we need strategies implemented all over the country. If I can have the privilege of running tap water 
so does the person in the rural areas deserve the same thing. We all deserve equal rights and equal service delivery. Thank you. Thank you. There is it. I use a pakunda visit before your lap. Dine the visit. Thanks, Malandela. Sit being a lele mongamel some fool. Deputy President Shenge, the old TG colleagues. Uh, mine, actually, I should say it's not a question but uh, I'm trying to establish from the panel. I heard Prof uh, mentioning throwing off water from the rivers in south of Deben to boost the dam, which is uh, another dam, I'm sure, is what he said. Um, that prompt, prompted me to say, if you look around, we have towns in, in the north of Mpangeni, which is um, Duba Duba, St. Lucia. Most of the time, if drought visits, visits the, the, those areas, we hear a lot of outcry from the communities out there. Um, how, should I say, how feasible it is that uh, water can be drawn from Pongolo Dam to uh, uh, assist or to boost the water uh, uh, service provision in Mdubadu and St. Lucia. I'm saying this on top of understanding that uh, there's only one farmer who's benefiting out of the Josini Dam water. The communities on the down side of, of, of Josini, I think a majority of them don't have tap water. Uh, but that is an arrangement from somewhere uh, which I, one cannot uh, uh, want to, to have it entertained. But it's just a matter of understanding the assistance of now Mthatuze uh, and and Tugel have Mgenin have been joined to to one water service authority. Uh, we are aware. No, I, I must say I'm aware. There is water that is drawn from Tugela to augment as well the south of of Tugela and part of uh, the Hooded Row. Uh, in, 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 in KCD municipality. Will there be any arrangement in future to assist those communities out there? Because the understanding is that we have some of the smaller towns that need to have water but currently have been exposed to water uh, uh, challenges at, at times. How possible it is that, uh, that can be done uh, if, if you look at uh, the period that will take, just an estimation for how long will it, will it, will it take our government to, to, to bring water to the Mtuba Tuba people? Uh, thank you. Thank you. Pungane. Thank you so much, Malandel. Um, Honorable President. Chief Whip, the Deputy President, um, Amakosi, Honorable Members, uh, and uh, all the colleagues in the House. Um, I had quite a number of questions, but I will only um, table two. The first one is on the issue of uh, rain harvesting, um, to check whether the panel um, could advise water service providers um, to consider rain harvesting. Um, number two is the balance of funds distribution um, against um, the challenge that uh, uh, water service providers um, that do not have a revenue base um, in that um, I've seen it that the department, in most cases, um, sometimes because of uh, the lack of capacity, the department, when intervening, would come with water service boards um, and, 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 and give them tasks to assist 
municipalities. The challenge in that is that um, uh, water boards are profit driven, um, yet people are unemployed. When there is an element of a water board, um, there has to be um, um, the balance uh, of paying for services. People will have to pay for services. Um, and uh, I compare that against the fact that if it was only a water service provider like a municipality, municipalities are able to accommodate indigent citizens um, in the areas. How do we strike um, a, um, um, the balance in that circumstance? Thank you. Thank you. Comrade Darcy. Thank you, Chairperson. I'd like to send, send my sincere uh, greetings to the President and the NEC members, and also all protocol observers. I think that we can agree that water is a basic need. Um, residents of Soweto can attest with the previous three days without uh, water. Uh, my question is, with the water pollution in South Africa, do you think that the country should invest more on water waste man treatment, treatment plans for water management. Um, I think urban cities uh, are able to save on water due to the fact that they've got proper drainage system and also they have um, flushing toilets and also bathrooms. Uh, considering that our state of water treatment plants are not well maintained, I'd also to like to further ask that how do we ensure that contaminated water are converted into water that is consume, uh, that we will be able to consume? And also one of the speakers said that we have boreholes as an alternative, which I think is quite progressive, uh, noting the fact that with boreholes, waters, we don't need to uh, spend more money on. In fact, we don't have to spend money at all on pur purification. However, my question is, will the water licensing exempt, exempt the boreholes uh, as an alternative water source? Uh, I think that's all. Thank you. Thank you. The last one. Greetings to the, to the house at large. Uh, my name is Singabila Mkwanazi. I'm from Ward 40. Um, I don't think it's a question merely, but uh, the first one, I'd like to have a clarity when at that heated moment you spoke about cholera. Um, you enlightened us about that cholera is not only spread through taps, right? And then not only through rivers, where you mentioned um, a Mozambican man that also went through Durban up until it went to Newcastle. So my question is, is it... Um, like right now, there's an outbreak at Haman Skral. Do we say that people in Haman Skral stay there? They don't move around? And do we also say that they just stay there on their own and there's no moving around from them to us? And then my second question is that, um, do the water, of, uh, do the Department of Water know that in some places in KZN where there are ground ups, oh, ginga. I'm not sure if I'm right, but I think they call ground out taps. That the water there, it actually burns um, um, electrical, your kettles, your, your stoves, your, once you just mix the water with something that is electrical. And this is happening in parts of Lime Hill, and I'm from there. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you for those questions. Uh, yes. Let's start with professor. professor. I still connected, Professor. Prof. or shall we load shading? Yeah, no, yeah. I think it's because of load shading and the poor connectivity. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> you can come in, Prof. I hope I, I hope you heard all the questions that. Uh, yes. Uh, yes, I did. I did hear all the. Uh, all the questions that I got. I'd just like to comment on that one gentleman who mentioned uh, that uh, water needs to be nationalized. 
It has already been nationalized. The National Water Act of 1998 uh, uh, nationalized the water. It all belongs to the state now. And uh, there are no more personal human rights. There are no more personal rights to water. Uh, it's separated from, from land ownership rights. So that has already happened. The, uh, the question of, of cholera, uh, let me just be quite explicit about this. Uh, let's not overreact to the thing. Uh, cholera, 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 without any question of doubt, is, is associated with water, as we know. But it's not associated with drinking water. All about drinking water in South Africa is SANS 241 uh, qualified. SANS 214 standard is, a, is an important standard for human health. There's no evidence whatsoever that any cholera has ever come through any tap, any drinking water. However, we, there's, a, there's a huge literature going back to the 18, 1850s on, on, on cholera, cholera and sewage. So cholera and sewage is directly correlated. There's no question of doubt about that. Uh, that the whole the entire literature tells us that. So it's where, where uh, people come into direct contact with, uh, with sewage contaminated water. Um, so that could be through a tanker. If a tanker has, for example, carried sewage before, or if a tanker has taken water out of a river rather than out of a SANS 241 standpipe. That's the important thing. Once a person has cholera, then they can transmit it to other people directly. Yes, they can do that. But, uh, but the original, the, the, the origin of it is, uh, is sewage contaminated water. And obviously, there can be no, no debate. It's, it's a matter of, uh, of literature and, uh, and, and common knowledge within the scientific community. Uh, I think that's, that's all I could answer. Um, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor. Prof? Okay. You know, I, I've been working on cholera since uh, there was an outbreak in the city of Beira in 1982. When the, what we did in Beira in 1982 when there was an outbreak, and it was the same sixth, we're not sure if it's the seventh pandemic, as an infection that comes from, South, from Asia and sweeps down African coast and actually ends up in South Africa, and it's happened four or five times. So there was this infection of cholera, 1980, 81, 82 was the time when we still had Samora Michelle whose, whose whole life had been about preventive health. And we were very anxious, and I say we because I was part of Mozambican government service at that point. We were very anxious to try and stop the spread of cholera. And there were many consultations about what could we do. And you can in fact treat people or you can dose people with an antibiotic, a sulfur, uh, a sulfur doxine, if I remember right, and that will take, a, that will, if you are a carrier of cholera, even if you're not sick, it will stop you from transmitting cholera, because cholera isn't spread by water, it isn't spread by sewage, it's spread if I can use the, uh, the phrase by excrement, I won't be, use the rude phrase, Dirty hands after going to the toilet and then preparing food or sharing food is the primary way that cholera is spread. It's through poor hygiene. And it's a very uncomfortable thing to talk about. So doctors prefer to talk about environmental health or we try to talk about water and sanitation systems, but actually it's about good personal hygiene. So in Beira, the entire population, quarter of a million people, were given a preventive dose of sulfadoxine to try and wipe out any cholera that might be sitting in the community. Because with cholera, quite often, for every one case of cholera, there are nine people who are infected but don't have any symptoms, but they can still spread it, like we had with COVID. Despite the fact that they tried to treat everybody in Beira and they put a cordon around the city so you weren't allowed to go out unless you could prove that you'd taken your tablets, the cholera carried on spreading. Because it only took one or two people who were infected, probably sub, subacutely, to get through the, the cordon, and it was a big cordon, and they would be able to take it to the next settlement. So I really think it's important for us to emphasize in our communities, that cholera in the first instance, like many other diseases, is spread by human contact and poor hygiene, which is why it's so important to have water and good sanitation facilities in every house, because then every house can keep hygienic practices. And really, we need to get away from this notion that the only way cholera affects a community is through water supply and bad sewage treatment, because most of the cholera that's spreading is actually through human contact, either directly or indirectly through food preparation. The terrible thing is because it's got so political, when I asked 
a particular national medical institution, could they come on record and, ref and say this and explain where the Hammond's Kral and the Paris cholera had come from, they said, we cannot talk about these. We have a protocol about how we can talk about outbreaks of cholera. And they weren't able to talk <coughs> publicly about the, the history of the cholera outbreak this time. And I think it is very dangerous then when we now start having people threatening legal cases because now they've got a further excuse for not talking about it. We can't say anything in case a case, this, this statement is used as evidence against us. Health should be something that we talk about and work together on. It shouldn't be something conflictual that we try to blame each other for. And I'm afraid that with cholera, we've made that mistake. We've turned it into a conflict which actually reduces our ability to talk about it in a way that helps people to avoid it. So I'm afraid I had to say that because it, it is a very real current problem. There were a couple of other questions, so if I can just try it, or do you want to take yours now? Okay, no, thanks, thanks Prof. Um, so the, the question on the, the audit um, of water, I want to assure you that the Department of water, uh, water and Sanitation, we do do an audit. We have, and remember the question on the boreholes, and I mentioned that we have the, the borehole program where we, we require boreholes to be registered. This allows us to manage whatever water we have available. We know that uh, over 75% of our water is already allocated of which more than 60% goes to agriculture. And how do we manage this? We manage it through, through our water use licensing. So whoever requires the use, whether it's a municipality, a mine, agriculture, we, 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 we require that they apply for a water use license. I want to assure you that water use licenses are not indefinite. We, they are time bound, and we allow them to, to come over periods so we can re, we re, review these licenses every five years. With regards to rainwater harvesting, Look, rainwater harvesting is not new. We've done it. Our, our grandfathers and grandmothers, we had this in the rural areas, rainwater harvesting. One of the things in terms of collaboration with other departments, we, we have, and I, if I recall uh, under uh, the leadership of, of Prof. when I was still in Eastern Cape, we had encouraged the Eastern Cape Housing uh, uh, Human Settlements Department, and especially outside Port Alfred, that whenever they built a house, <clears throat> a tank was attached to that house. A tank costs 2,500 with connected. So these are things that in collaboration with other departments we can do and we really support rainwater harvesting. Let me come to Pongola, Port, uh, Pongola, not Pongola, uh, Pongola Dam. Now, one of the things we must realize and it comes to nationalization of water is there are a number of dams owned by various, and they, there's various reasons why the dams are there. It could be a small agricultural dam, could be a stock dam, etc. In the previous era, and especially Josini Pongolpur Dam, was built for one purpose and one purpose only. There was approximately 4,000 white farmers that were going to resettle in the area, and the Pongolpur Dam then was, and I'm, I had to go into my history to read this, was this built and designed to provide water for agriculture for those 4,000 farmers. What has happened since the dawn of democracy? Ministers, and especially with uh, my minister, Senzo Ntunu, has insisted that these dams become multi-purpose dams. So, you go to Pongor Josini Dam now, you'll find we have, um, uh, what is that fishing they do? Uh, there's fishing, there's agricultural activities, we encourage communities to have educational facilities, there is ecotourism taking place. But initially, Pongoda Port was specific for one reason, and there were many other dams that were constructed like that. So with, under our leadership now, we've gone for multi-purpose dams. Let me answer you the question with regards to a single user, and I'll be very short. So what happened, the particular user, I'm not going to mention names, license has come up for review. We understood why at that time the, the water, he was providing the facility, so the infrastructure that was there, he had a storage facility, abstraction storage, and a pipeline running to our municipalities. The municipality did then were using that infrastructure. Recently, what, what, well, if I can use under my leadership, what we did, we have allocated water to Zululand. They have an allocation. Part of the condition of the license, within five years, they would need to have their own abstraction and pipeline. Go there today, 
The pipeline is under construction at the moment. And under the leadership of Minister, we've, we've now accelerated the pipeline that it does not benefit one municipality, which is going to Manlakas towards Nongoma. I know it because I'm dealing with it. That you find that the abstraction comes from Pongola port, it runs past from Kuze, so we'll have an offtake to Mkuze, Mkanyukude, and then it'll, it'll come to Malagas, and then it'll go to Slabisa that way. So this, and if you're out. Sorry? <laughs> well, so to, 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 to confirm, these are, yes, it has taken long. Yes, there have been historics. But we have tried to correct one multi-purpose, from single purpose to multi-purpose, and where a, a, a particular infrastructure was designed for one, we know that this is a cross-border municipality, Mkanyakuda, Zululand, and that we provide the water to, to those areas. So that is just one, one initiative that we have. Let me stop there, Doc. Uh, Prof? Uh, program Director, can I just yes, finish? Because I'd like to build on this. Remind me what the name of the irrigation area is below the Pongola Dam, the, the, the huge, where the 4,000 white farmers were going to be. Uh, Mjindi. 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 Yeah, was just part of it, wasn't it? Yeah. I understood there was a whole area downstream of Pongola which had been allocated for irrigation and not much had happened. In fact, it, Mjindi Cotton, I seem to remember. Yes, yes, yes. I took a walk along there. <laughs> what, was the, what was the name of the man who was running it? He, he was very strong in the community, but he, he had a little concession to grow cotton and grow vegetables. But there had been problems of getting that land developed and it certainly wasn't intended for one farmer as uh, Ashley has said it was intended for 4,000 white farmers and then with the political changes the water was available the land was available all it required was a little bit of political will and imagination to get the water onto the land with people to use and I think it has been going very slowly so I, I, I don't think it's correct to say Pongola was intended for one person, or it was intended for 4,000 white. And I say this because we wrote it into three or four strategies. It's in the National Development Plan, which that bit that I drafted is in quite a few national policy documents. We must develop this irrigation potential. But there's been blockages. And I think the people of that region need to explain what the blockages are, because it's, it's a very rich potential irrigation area. We need agricultural activity high intensity, irrigated, high productive, and it's not happening as fast as it should have because after 30 years, not enough has happened. I just did want to also talk about this question of are we water scarce or not? Because on the one hand, we heard earlier that 98% of the uh, allocatable water has already been used, so in other words, we've only got 2% of water. That's wrong, uh, although if you listen carefully, the water that can be allocated, i.e. the water that's sitting in dams which we can allocate with a reasonable degree of reliability, well, that's actually only 30 or 40 percent of the water that is allocatable at the moment because we haven't got the dams and the structures to take the rest. We're currently using between 35 and 40 percent of South Africa's water. So we're not that water scarce. But every new bit of water, every new drop of water is more and more and more expensive. And to the younger generation is something called a budget constraint. There's so much money available, and if you spend it here, you can't spend it there. So it doesn't make sense to develop very expensive water unless you're quite sure how and where and why you're going to use it. But we certainly haven't run out of water but uh, what water is available is going to be very expensive to make sure it's always available even in a drought year and stored behind a dam because that's the only way you can be sure it'll be available in a drought year. And that brings me to the question of climate change and I'm glad we haven't talked too much about climate change because it's a very important issue but it's a longer term issue. And, you know, again, I, I'm afraid because I've turned from a DG into being an academic, I spend a lot of time talking to the global leaders on these issues and reading the literature because I've got access to all the university literature. And I think what we can say is the following about climate change in South Africa. Firstly, what we're sure about is it's going to get much hotter. Okay, no question. You wouldn't think so with the snow we had in Joburg, but it's getting hotter. Uh, and that's not unexpected because you have these extremes, but you also have a general trend of getting hotter. 
The good news is that the hotter it gets, the more water comes out of the land and, and the sea into the atmosphere. So there's more water sitting up in the sky, which means when it rains, it's going to rain harder. You might have noticed this in Durban, uh -huh, with those floods. And we've seen some of these more intense rainstorms up here in Gauteng as well. So there's going to be more water and more rain, but it's hotter. So there's a third question. When that rain falls, where does it go? And if it's very hot, quite a lot of it will evaporate straight back again. But if we're careful and we drain it and we store it, maybe there's going to be more water available than there has been. Now, and I must be careful because there's a representative of the Konrad Adenauer Foundation and I spend a lot of time fighting with German environmentalists <laughs> who tell Africans how to manage the African environment. <laughs> and they make me very cross because they're wrong. In Europe, which is a, a humid environment, when it rains, the water <coughs> floods and it's quite difficult to get the water to flow away. What you try and do is you try and spread the water as far as possible. You try not to uh, let it... Uh, channel into, into very damaging uh, f flood uh, co concentrations. And that makes perfect sense for the humid, cool, wet climate of northern Europe, which includes Germany. The thing in Africa is that the ground is actually quite dry. We, don't, we want to get as much of the water into the ground and underground, and what doesn't go into the ground and underground, we want to get to the rivers and the dams. And so we have to have a different strategy to manage the rainfall changes of climate change, which is completely the opposite of what Europe does. The trouble is, the whole <coughs> who was it who studied in Germany? We can learn a lot from the Germans. <laughs> we can learn how coalitions cause problems. You know? We can learn all sorts of things. We can learn about federalism. But we should be very careful about taking lessons from them about managing water under climate change in humid conditions and try and apply it to arid conditions. And, you know, I've been writing about this one, I think one of our best cited, the most cited papers is actually about adapting to climate change in Africa because it actually is different to adapting for climate change in Europe. So I just wanted to reinforce that point about scarcity and about climate change. And then also to say that quite close to your damn problem with your farmer in Pongola, you know, we have some excellent examples and people were asking us about cooperation between private and public sectors. Now, the Bivani Dam, which is on a, a tributary upstream of the Pongola, but it's a tributary of the Pongola, it's upstream of the dam, was a cooperative venture between some white sugar farmers in a, in a, in a water user association, and they asked for permission to build a dam. And I remember going down there with Kada Asmal and we said, right, we'll give you permission. You can spend 100, 200 million rand on a dam. Here's the conditions. There's 350,000 people in the area. They must all have water from that dam. There are not enough black farmers in your sugar uh, business. In fact, we can't see any. You've got to change that. We want 30%, I think it was, or maybe it was 20%, and afterwards we said we should have asked for 30% of the land. We want you to allocate 30% of the, the new irrigated land to new farmers. They gave the water to the tribal authority. They got the land and they irrigated the land for new sugar farmers from the black community. And I thought that was one of the better examples of how you can mix and match private and public uh, poor and well-off into, into a common development to use water effectively. And I'm always surprised that we don't talk, talk more about it as an example. And perhaps it is because the sugar industry is running into such big problems at the moment that I know they worried about whether those sugar farmers are going to be able to survive under the new sugar dispensation. So, you know, we have, we, the nice thing about the water sector, perhaps as a concluding remark, is listening to this conversation. You know, this is so different from the electricity discussion. Here things are happening, things are being done, questions are being raised, there are answers. Yes, it's complicated, but actually, with people like Ashley and his colleagues and the new minister and the new DG, we seem to have something of a handle on water. And we must try and avoid having water turned into a political fight. Because the one thing we know about water is it's everybody's business. And if we all work together to manage the water, we can actually manage it quite well. 
But we have to work against each other. And the water law that was put in place back in 98 was very much designed to kind of encourage, if not force, this kind of cooperation. That's why it's very important to, that you have this session today. I, I hope it's been instructive. It's been really useful hearing the questions because actually we can hear what people know and what they don't know and try and address that. And I hope Ashley is able to take it. Uh, thank you very much to our panelists and thank you very much to delegates. It was a very uh, quantitative discussion and informative and we've learned. And thank you for being a good audience. Um, without wasting time, immediately uh, I'll, I'll ask Honorable Stolle to come and help uh, me give the, our panelists just a small token of appreciation. Uh, I don't know what we'll do with you, okay, Professor, online. We will email it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, thank you very much, our panelists, and thank you very much. Uh, immediately, then I will ask uh, Honorable Singh to take over. Mina Mind Gupelala. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Honorable uh, uh, Malandela. Greetings to our president and the leadership of, of, of the party. Uh, actually, we want to thank you for, to, for coming to, 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 to this summit because actually as a party we benefit a lot from what you have said and something need to be implemented from the divine department. Thank you very much. Can uh, Mr. Andres also come up and uh, receive something? Thank you. Right, thank you very much uh, to our panelists, to our moderator. Uh, well done, Malandela. Uh, your training helped you. Uh, colleagues, Mr. President and colleagues, there's a slight change in the program now. Since we had to break for tea, and I'm sure everybody is feeling quite healthy and, and, and full. So we are going to delay lunch a bit. We've got Dr. Kuvadia online. Now, you will recall that yesterday, we, Dr. Kavadia was uh, out of the country. She was going to be one of our health panelists. And uh, she's got a very, very busy day today. And we were going to bring her in at 10 past at 1. So we thought, let's give her an opportunity. Uh, and then thereafter, if there are any questions that you want to ask her, and then we can break for lunch thereafter. So Dr. Kavadia, I hope you're online. I just want to introduce you. Yes, thank you very much. Well, Dr. Kuvadia is a medically trained doctor with a master's in health economics and the core technical actuarial board exams. In addition, she has been trained in maths and statistics, business management, good clinical practice, health informatics, strategy, and governance. After qualifying as a doctor, she worked for both public and private hospitals in KwaZulu-Natal, uh, uh, Honorable... Alderman, before taking up a research position at the Human Science Research Council funded by the Rockefeller Foundation, where she worked on models for orphan and vulnerable children care. She is a founder and partner of Usizo Advisory Services, which is an independent advisory firm. She was the head of healthcare and life sciences for Africa at KPMG for five years, during which time she led over 23 projects related to universal health coverage across Africa, Asia, and the Middle East, as well as being a consultant to the International Finance Corporation. She is now a strategic healthcare advisor to KPMG in Africa and an independent consultant. She is also a non-executive director at DISCHEM, a non-executive director for the Dawi Clinics Group in Egypt, 
a member of the Center for the AIDS Program Investment Committee, a member of the Durban Girls College Board, a member of the Anton Lambeda School of Innovation and Leadership Board, a trustee for the Kendra Educational Trust, a board member there, a board member of St. John's DSG and commercial head for Vula Medical Referral App. Recently, Dr. Kuvadia worked on a project to implement the national health insurance in Zambia, supporting a vaccine initiative in Botswana, conducting the 2021 strategy for the government employees medical scheme, GEMS, some of you are on GEMS, developing reports for World Health Organization, and she developed a health quality assessment tool for the IFC to be used to improve health service delivery in organizations in emerging markets. She also works with a number of private equity funds on their investments in health technology and infrastructure. We've given Dr. Kovadia a background of why we are here. We want to inform ourselves uh, as this group on the NHI, uh, what it will mean, what the challenges are, what the advantages, disadvantages, and what pointers you can give us uh, as, as uh, the IFP so that when we propose amendments to the legislation, we can do so from an informed basis. So over to you, uh, Dr. Kavadia, and thank you very much for agreeing to be with us. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here this afternoon. I'm sorry I'm standing between you and your lunch, but hopefully we'll be able to make uh, the next half an hour exciting, impactful, and um, engaging. I apologize I couldn't be there in person, but I've just come in from overseas. But I'm very, very keen to engage with you on any comments or questions you may have. Um, and I thought I would share with you over the last 10 to 15 years um, in a story format. I've spent um, the majority of my time working with different governments around the world and supporting them on improving their healthcare sector, um, implementing universal healthcare coverage, um, and standing up national health insurance funds. Um, countries that I've worked in include India, um, Saudi Arabia, um, Kenya, Tanzania, um, Ghana, the Bahamas, um, and many other countries. And really the, the lessons that I'd like to share with you today are hopefully to further the conversation that you had yesterday in the NHI panel, and also just to add um, my views on how I believe we should move forward as South Africa. Where we stand right now, and the very interesting point we are at in our history, really is going to make or break the healthcare system that we've got for the next generations. And in my view, I think there are two key threats that will influence how we move forward. Um, the first is ideology, and the second is vested interests. So I thought I would frame my uh, discussion with you today uh, through these two lenses. I think it's important for us to first have a quick reflection on where we stand globally in terms of healthcare post the pandemic. Globally, if you refer to the upper rectangle, you will see that um, we are impacted by three major different types of diseases. The first in blue are the non-communicable conditions, and the size of each block tells you how big the impact of these diseases are on us. So you'll see globally ischemic heart disease, stroke, um, diabetes, uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, depression, anxiety, headaches are some of the biggest challenges we face. In the orange are the infectious diseases that are impacting us globally. And you'll see the biggest drivers of disease are neonatal conditions, diarrhea, malaria, lower resp respiratory tract infections, and tuberculosis. And then in the green, you'll see the uh, remaining conditions that impact us are falls, road injuries, self-harm, violence, etc. It's important to understand where we stand in South Africa as it relates to the burden of disease that we're facing, because that's really what we're trying to solve with the design of our future healthcare system. We have what they, uh, they call a quadruple burden of disease. We have a very high burden of disease due to non-communicable conditions, such as your diabetes, stroke, ischemic heart disease. But we've got one of the greatest burdens of disease related to infectious diseases, HIV, tuberculosis, et cetera. And we've got quite a high burden of disease related to violence and self-harm. 
it's important for us to have this backdrop. And then the second thing I'd like us to reflect on is how do we pay for healthcare? Because how you pay for healthcare determines a lot of the different aspects of the delivery and performance of the healthcare system. So globally, it's quite interesting to note when you look at the graph on the right, that governments around the world contribute the majority of the healthcare funding. That's the, the graphs and the, the elements in the blue. In orange, you see out-of-pocket expenditure, and in purple, you see prepaid or private healthcare insurance. Now, what is quite important to note is that all the sources of healthcare funding have increased really substantially over the last few decades, and it's expected that these sources of funding are going to increase quite dramatically up to 2050. It's expected that the predominant funding of healthcare is going to remain in the public sector. It's going to be government driven. But you can see that the out of pocket expenditure, the orange band, is really the band that we're trying to control. Because when a person has to pay for healthcare out of pocket, we see the worst healthcare outcomes and we see the highest level of expenditure and the most devastating financial impact at a household level. If we look at South Africa compared to the rest of the world, the current healthcare expenditure of South Africa um, in the red line and the top left-hand graph, you can see that we are in line with um, uh, the world, just below the global average, and um, we are above other low or middle-income countries. When you look at out-of-pocket expenditure, which is the graph on the right, you'll see that the South African out-of-pocket expenditure, which is cash expenditure for healthcare, is actually quite low compared to the rest of the world. So that's quite a positive sign that South Africans are not spending as much of their cash after tax income as other countries in the rest of the world. But the problem comes in, and this is really the problem we're trying to solve here. The problem comes in when you look at what is the bang for your buck we're getting as South Africans. And you can see when you look at the average life expectancy of South Africa, we are way out of um, performance compared to other middle income countries. In fact, we're barely keeping track with low income countries. You can see that up to the 1990s, South Africa was tracking along with the rest of the world and we're doing fairly well. We had an average life expectancy of about 66 years. But then you can see there was a very, very rapid fall off and that was predominantly driven by the HIV AIDS epidemic. But you can see that we haven't recovered to where we should be. And this is an incredibly important graph. I'd really like you to have a good look at it. Average life expectancy is intrinsically linked to the economic performance and development of a country. I've done some modeling um, for one of the clients I worked for in the past, and we found that there was a direct link between the gain in life expectancy and the growth of the GDP of a country. I think the, the specific um, data we found was that for every year you gain in average life expectancy, you can improve the GDP of a country up to 4%. So you can see how the, the relatively poor average life expectancy in South Africa is really impacting our future economic growth and development. Now, why does, why does universal healthcare coverage make both financial sense an ideological sense for our country, for our patients, and for our doctors. Because there's no other way we're going to solve that picture and solve the problem of our very poor health system's performance without really moving towards a system that has better access, better affordability, and better quality of care. From a South African perspective, universal health care coverage could lead to higher life expectancy, like I said, there's a proven link that um, increased life expectancy leads to increased economic growth at um, uh, um, corporate or um, employment level. We see increased productivity. We see reduced absenteeism. We see reduced inequality, reduced poverty. We see better social cohesion. We see improved health outcomes and we see reduced downstream costs of unnecessary or um, um, un uncontrolled healthcare expenditure. Why does universal healthcare coverage make sense to patients? 
For patients, when you have better universal healthcare coverage in a country, there's a better access to healthcare services. The services are closer to home and you see better health outcomes for patients. We see financial protection, so families are not devastated by having to pay for healthcare outcome instead of buying food. We see better equity for vulnerable populations and we have a greater focus on patient-centric care. Most importantly, in a universal healthcare coverage system, we see care across the continuum of healthcare. So right from the beginning where you have better preventative care to better diagnosis, better screening, better vaccination, greater access to hospitalization, and then finally at the end stages of life, in a universal healthcare coverage system, you have stronger palliative care mechanisms. In terms of the providers, I've worked in, I think, more than 40 different countries around the world on universal health care coverage. And by and large, we've seen increased patient volumes and increased profitability for providers. In systems that are well managed and that are fair, there are more stable and predictable payment streams. There should be a reduced administrative burden. Providers should have a better ability to focus on preventative and chronic care, and there should be better opportunities for innovation and, and quality improvements, as well as greater access to partnership opportunities. So I think the case for universal healthcare coverage is unequivocal, um, but the question is, how do we move towards universal healthcare coverage? There's no single way of accessing universal healthcare coverage. There are many different paths that can lead us to the same place. And that is why I think it's important for us to understand how do we look at the different ideologies around the world and what is the evidence for performance? The dominant ideology and the ideology which our NHI bill is tending towards is a nationalized system, which is a single fund. The classic example of this is the UK, the NHS. And in this system, the government is responsible for financing and administrating health care for all the citizens. It's funded by taxes and there's a single fund. The providers in the system are mostly public and their prices are fixed. The advantage of the system is that everybody has access to care, there are lower health care costs and there are reduced administrative costs. But the disadvantages are very real. There are very long waiting times. It's very difficult to access care. In fact, I think in the UK yesterday, they were saying that there's a trend of patients having to pull out their own teeth because they simply can't get to a dentist in the NHS. There's a limited choice and there's higher taxes. At the other extreme, the other ideology is a pure market-based ideology. And in a market-based ideology, we see the typical system you'd see in the US which is completely driven by competition and it's designed and created by market forces and competition. The way of paying for healthcare is cash and in the US we've got very limited public funding, Medicare and Medicaid. Predominantly providers are private and there's no limitation on the fees they charge. The advantages are that you see that patients have a greater level of choice, there's very, very high levels of innovation, and there's a lower taxation burden for healthcare. But the disadvantages, again, are very real. You have limited access. People who can't afford to pay for healthcare simply cannot access it. There are higher overall costs. They are the highest administrative costs in the world, where they say up to um, 30 to 40 cents in a dollar actually go towards administration as opposed to actual clinical services. And the poorer health outcomes are seen in these types of systems, particularly in chronic disease management, mental health care, palliative care. So in the middle, what sits in the middle? In the middle, the classic example is the Dutch health care system. And here you've got managed competition with insurance or medical schemes. And this is similar to a public-private partnership. Everybody in the country is covered by multiple managed healthcare funds. Everybody um, has a compulsory premium. Providers are predominantly private, but patients are given choice within a network. They have good access and the rates are negotiated. So there's overall, there's a lower healthcare cost. 
But there's limited access based on affordability. Um, there could be higher costs and higher administrative costs. So I think it's very important for us to understand that there are many different ways of constructing a healthcare system. And at one extreme, we have a single fund, a nationalized system like the UK. And at the other extreme, we have a pure market-based economy like the US. Both of them have their challenges and both of them are not providing evidence that they are future fit, healthy and resilient healthcare systems. So what is the impact we're seeing of ideology and vested interests in healthcare systems? Firstly, we're seeing that the ideology, is it a market-based like the US or is it a nationalized system like the UK? Um, these, these biases are really influencing healthcare policy. And instead of designing healthcare policy that's based on evidence, we're having healthcare policy design that's based on politics. And this is really resulting in a lack of consideration of the most um, latest thinking in healthcare. And what we know is the best way, evidence-based way of managing a person's health over their lifetime. Vestus interests are really impacting the way resources are allocated. Um, for example, private healthcare providers, uh, pharmaceutical companies, and in healthcare systems, we're seeing if vested interests, either the government or the uh, private sector, are driving an unequal um, allocation of healthcare resources. We're also seeing that ideology and vested interests are impacting the affordability of healthcare. They are impacting the um, adoption of new technologies, which is resulting in a slower pace and progress. They are resulting in greater health inequalities and disparities. They're influencing the quality of healthcare, and they are also eroding the trust that the public have in their healthcare system. So when we think of healthcare, I think we've learned a lot from the pandemic, but we are really starting to see that healthcare is moving away from caring for the sick to moving towards caring and keeping people healthy. It's no longer about just the length of a person's life, it's about the quality of life that people lead. We've seen that it's important to move away from reactive care, treating a patient when they're sick, to moving towards a more proactive means of actually preventing and limiting the impact of illness. We need to move away from a very siloed approach where doctors don't talk to each other, lab tests are not shared, a patient doesn't really have um, an understanding of how to navigate their healthcare system to a more proactive um, form of care and an integrated healthcare network. The best healthcare systems in the world have understood that we cannot just continue diagnosing and treating patients. We need to learn how to screen and prevent care. We've got to move away from having a very provider-centric system to having more of a patient-centric system that is a mixture of the physical and virtual world. And it's no longer having a doctor for life, but it's having a doctor at my convenience. So how do we get this new healthcare equation right? We've got to deal with changing demographics. We've got to deal with the impact of economics. We've got to look at the impact the burden of disease, the behavior of our populations. We've got to take into consideration scientific advances. We've got to look at technology and how it's changing the way we practice. We've got to understand how to measure and manage human capital, how we drive the right forms of leadership, how we create the sufficient amount of infrastructure, communication, business optimization, and financial management. And there are probably many, many more other levers that we need to think about that are part of this equation. But ultimately, what do we want as a country? We want good access. We want affordable care. We want good quality care. We want to be connected and continuous in the way we provide care. And we want our citizens to be satisfied. And we want our doctors and healthcare workers to be engaged motivated and fulfilled. So the NHI has been proposed as the financing mechanism, and there are many strengths and weaknesses to the proposal in the bill, but I thought I would isolate a few of them. The first is that the first strength that the, the NHI has is that it promotes health equity and social solidarity. So from a strength perspective, it, it's 
designed to make sure that everyone has access to quality of health care, regardless of their income and health status. It is intended to stimulate efficiency and quality improvement across both the public and private sector um, by creating a single purchaser that can hopefully be able to negotiate better rates and raise the standards. And it's aligned with the constitutional right to health care in South Africa and the global movement towards universal health care coverage, which will have a positive impact on the health of our people and the economic development of our country. But what are the weaknesses that are very real and need to be overcome? The weaknesses of the current bill, as it's uh, constituted, is that it faces massive administrative and funding challenges, given the limited tax base, tax base, the sluggish economy, the poor track record of public sector management and corruption. The bill lacks clarity and details of how the fund will be financed, governed, regulated and monitored, which has raised very real concerns about its feasibility, accountability and sustainability. And it is very likely that the bill is going to face resistance and legal challenges um, from multiple different parties who have different interests and views on the reform. So how do we manage the threats of ideology and vested interests in South Africa? Um, the first thing is we need to really focus on having evidence-based policy making. We need to make sure that we've learned from the experience globally on how we make the best decisions based on sound research, data, and evaluation. We've got to take into consideration diverse stakeholders' views and get their input. Um, and I think to date, there's been a criticism that the NHI bill has not considered the views of diverse stakeholders. There needs to be transparency and accountability. We need independent evaluation and oversight. We have to make sure that we pre prevent the impact of undue influence and we implement sound anti-corruption measures. We need to build capacity and expertise in health policy. We've got to foster public understanding and awareness, and we should really learn from the experience globally on what has worked and what hasn't worked. We're not the first country to implement an NHI, and there are definite trends that we've seen on countries that have been more successful and less successful. So in South Africa, how do we move forward? In my view, an NHI is a mechanism of using national health care funds better, but we cannot have an NHI in the absence of public sector strengthening. It's almost the same as having a cell phone without any network or coverage. It really becomes a meaningless exercise if you have a fund that pays for health care, but the public sector is actually unable to deliver the health care that's promised. What we've seen globally is the best way to start is to start slow and build up true value. And there are very, very easy ways we can do that in South Africa. Um, an example of an effective program that has worked in the public sector is the CCMDD program, which is the delivery of chronic medicines to patients. This program is very successful and could be expanded. Primary health care is definitely a very, very important starting point from the NHI, um, giving people access to general practitioners in the private and public sector is a very, very good way of starting to give them um, a better um, uh, level of service close to home. Digital health care is a very easy way of providing online access to virtual care, which could be a very meaningful, helpful mechanism that could give people access to true value. But at this stage, given our economic picture and given the cost of healthcare, financial modeling that I've done recently using medical scheme data really makes it seem that a comprehensive package um, in the NHI bill is unrealistic. The third aspect is really understanding that we all need com competition. Government needs competition and private sector needs competition. In many countries, we see that NHIs can coexist very nicely alongside private health insurers in a managed competition framework. People should choose to belong to an NHI rather than having it forced down their throats like a bitter pill. It is important to have competition between the NHI and private insurers for innovation, affordability, and quality of care. 
So either one without the other becomes dangerous in terms of prices, quality, innovation, and access. And then from the fourth, my fourth point is that operationally, an NHI is a massive and complex undertaking. There will be hundreds and hundreds of millions of claims to process, calls to take, queries to take, um, and motivations, etc. So it's important that it is not created um, as a new system. We need to tap into the existing capabilities that are already here in South Africa in both the public and private sector. And then the last point I'd like to make today is that this is a personal issue. Healthcare is personal. The healthcare system that we are creating um, will be the system that our children use and that we use in our later years. And it's been decided now. So I think the most important part is for us to continue to engage on it and continue to discuss it, but also to understand that this is really a marathon we're in. It's what we do every day that counts. Um, the option of doing nothing at all doesn't work. Uh, we need to make small, consistent efforts so that every step we take forwards really helps craft out a system that is evidence-based, that has strong levels of leadership, that has effective governance structures, that allows a multi-funder approach to managing the South African population, that doesn't compromise on quality to get access, and that ensures that we are not creating a system of the past, but really trying to innovate and leapfrog the way we provide healthcare services to our citizens. Thank you. I'll stop there, and I'm very happy to take any question. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kovadia, for that uh, insightful presentation. Very practical. I liked your comparisons of, of what works, what does not work, and the middle of the road approach. And I see your mathematic training came in in the end with that equation there, which we're still trying to understand with the 365 days. But thank you very, very much. And, 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 and I like the way that you, you presented it and your topic was ideology, trust, because that's exactly what it's about in, in, in our country. Uh, you may not want to get into the politics of it, but uh, there's no doubt in the minds of many of us that uh, NHI, the bill was pushed through Parliament uh, so that South Africans can be told as we near the election that, well, here we are, we've arrived, we've done something for you, and then nothing happens for the next 20 years. So, so, so thank you very much for that. And I like the fact that you spoke about the Dutch healthcare system, which I think... Uh, uh, Honorable uh, Ateba, you need to look at. Uh, we need to research that, our researchers here. Yeah, look at the Dutch healthcare system. Because our intention as the IFP, as you know, the bill has already been passed through the National Assembly. <clears throat> it's uh, by majority vote. We objected to the bill, uh, not because we object to the provision of universal health care or health care for all the citizens of South Africa, quality health care, but we objected on the basis of the governance aspects. And I think that's what you've highlighted, the governance and the mm -hmm. lack of governance aspects. And we heard Dr. Mzugwa say to us yesterday that in 1994 we were promised water, uh, South Africans, everybody, his own district of Flagstaff today, 30 years later, does not have water. So can we trust this government in its current form to make sure that they deliver on the promises of the NHI? But I think, colleagues, for those of us that are here, there was an interesting kind of uh, backtracking or a revelation by Dr. Crisp yesterday when he presented right towards the end. He says, well, this is a long haul thing. You know, it's, it, it, it's not uh, uh, an event, it's a process. And, and that's what you've picked up. We agree it should be a process. But what is that process going to be? We don't know. I don't think Honorable Schlangwa in that committee knows what that process is going to be. So we don't want to be told about a process that's going to be unfold when we don't have a clear pathway. We, we, we'd like to drive from here to Cape Town. We need to plan our route. We know we'll have to stop somewhere on the road all the way before we get there. But government is not telling us those things. They, they fixated on the ideological perspective of this. So having said that, thank you very much. Right, let's see some hands. I know uh, hands will go up slowly because uh, you think lunch is coming uh, <laughs> soon. But uh, let's see some hands in the audience on questions to Dr. Kovadia, please. That's number one there. 
I can uh, oh sorry I can't see with the light there's uh, number two here questions to Dr. Kovadia on, on, on what she's told us there's two there and there's three there okay so let's take those three for now and then let's go number one sorry I'm calling your number good afternoon my name is Boniswa Nongoba I just want to find out if does the government go back to the community about the NHI thank you crisp question we spoke about stakeholder consultation and we were told yesterday that some were not consulted adequately 12,000 medical professionals they were not consulted adequately and then perhaps dr. Kubadia just to add to your question my sister is is, is was your organization requested to make a, a representation to the portfolio committee or or the white paper or the green paper and have you done so and were any of those recommendations taken seriously number two please uh, good, good day, everyone. Um, my name is Ndutu Zungamala from Ward 30, from Ward 75. Uh, my question to the doctor is, looking at the past bill that has been presented to Parliament and has been passed by the majority of the governing party, if I may put it that way, do you think this bill that has been passed is a good to go for South Africa or it's something that we still need to work on to iron some issues that uh, or other things that need to be ironed within that uh, uh, bill. Do, do you, as, a, as an expert, because we've worked with many countries on this issue, do you think, are we good to go with the, this bill that has been presented before us? Thank you. Number three. I can't see from here. Where's our UK expert? Question, right, there. Studied in the UK, President, this young lady for a long time. Your question. Um, <laughs> I didn't want to ask any questions, TG, but um, just um, I think I would like to send my apologies in advance to Dr. Kuvada if she has covered this aspect because I took a comfort break for a good five minutes. Um, if she had, um, my sincere apologies in advance. But I just wanted to. We had a very um, robust engagement yesterday regarding the issue of NHI. And um, some of the panelists, or actually, Dr. was it Dr. Chris, that was very violently opposed to making reference to the UK um, and other OECD countries. And, and I think he was, to a certain extent he was right because if we're making these comparisons, we need to compare apples with apples and not compare apples with meat, for example. So can we, can we withdraw or infer with countries that we have a similar um, sort of context with? Can we look at countries that we have the same GDP, the same Gini coefficient, probably the same population size, the same political dynamics. Can we look at those examples and say, this is how they've done it? If there's any, um, I, I, I heard that you, you were working in Zambia, and I understand that Ghana, uh, in, in, in the African context, has, has implemented um, NHI. I'm not sure about Nigeria and other countries. But can, as we are looking into OECD countries, can we come back home, or even not at home, but can we compare from low middle income countries and say this is what our peers have done it. We can't compare, we can't say the UK is our peer or the Netherlands is our peer or America for that matter. Those are powerhouses in terms of almost everything. Can we compare apples with apples w from a systematic point of view? Thank you very much. Okay, uh, over to you Dr. Kowalia. Okay, thank you very much for those excellent questions. I'll just work from one beginning to the end. Um, in terms of the um, I'm not close to the NHI process, but I do believe that there's going to be uh, provincial consultations. And as far as I'm aware, those provincial consultations should be open to anybody from the community. The challenge is at this stage, um, I'm not sure whether the community will um, be sure of the process and we're unsure 
mindful of whether the community will be equipped and educated and get the opportunity to consult effectively. Um, as far as I'm aware, the submissions that were made to the portfolio committee by a number of different parties across the industry were not taken into consideration. So that's to answer the second question. Um, and my organization did not submit or was not requested to submit any information either. In terms of the third question, which is a very, very good question about the bill today, are we good to go? I uh, don't believe that we're good to go in the current bill. There are some things that really worry me and I don't think have been adequately addressed. I do understand it's a bill and it talks about overarching principles, but to to present such a bill and not be very clear on what the exact benefits are in the benefit package, what the um, uh, exact uh, financial um, feasibility studies are, what the precise role of the private sector medical schemes and the governance structure are specific areas that really concern me with the existing bill. It's very vague. And I'm currently working on the implementation of the national health insurance system in Egypt. So just to give you an idea, in Egypt, which is um, a similar um, economic country to South Africa, they have been implementing an NHI over the last five to seven years. They started in a single province and they've been rolling it out slowly province by province, but still, about 70 to 80% of the private providers have not become accredited or registered. This is another very important aspect of the bill. It, it says that every single provider who provides services to the NHI needs to be accredited and registered and meet a certain level of quality. From what I've seen in Egypt over the last five to seven years, um, this is not as easy to achieve as it sounds. Many of the providers do not have the system, they don't have the platforms, they don't have the technology, they don't have the administrative capabilities. So um, on paper, it sounds good, but practically it's a very, very difficult exercise. The actual benefits are incredibly important. And that is why I say that South Africa should right now focus on strengthening the public sector and providing a package of primary healthcare services that are affordable. As it stands now, it is very unlikely that a comprehensive benefit package is affordable by this country. Um, I think it, the, the budget figures that we've seen for the NHI are somewhere around 240 billion. But I think this is a this will not even cover you know, a, a marginal fraction of a comprehensive package for the whole country. What we've seen globally is that when an NHI is rolled out to a country, there are different uh, phenomenons that come into place. Firstly, you have people who have very low health-seeking behavior because they've never had access to care. So they are slow to learn to use the system. But once they start using the system, they use it a lot because they have a very high burden of disease. Um, then we see um, an, the impact of different aging populations. Um, and we see the impact of high utilization because of a lack, lack of access to pre seem to have lost you, or lost connectivity. Technicians, is it load shedding on that end, our end? Well, here it is. <coughs> We've got a, a professional as a panelist. But, Hi, uh, sorry. We lost you for a second. Sorry, I, I think I lost you for a minute. Yeah. Yes, I'm sorry about that. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Please go ahead. Hello. Yes, we can hear you now. Hi. Yes, uh, apologies. I just wanted to answer the last question because I thought it was a particularly good question. Um, when we look at countries around the world that are similar income countries, um, a recent study that we've conducted has looked at Ghana, Indonesia, Egypt, Morocco, and Thailand. And there are some very clear lessons for South Africa that come out of the experience with these different countries. Ghana has a multi-funder system 
Um, it has had an NHI for the last 15 years. That's no, we lost. I think you, you muted. Uh, so oh, we can switch your camera off. That's a younger Dr. Kuvadia. <laughs> you can switch your camera off. Uh, perhaps that will help, and then we'll get a network. Hi, is that a bit clearer? Yes, yes. Okay, apologies for that. I think my Wi-Fi is going down. But um, in terms of what we can learn from Ghana um, and what's happened with their system, um, we've seen that we have to be very careful to curb corruption and political interference from the start. Accountability and careful professional management is one of the most important factors for a successful NHI system. And we've got to learn that we've got to have a very broad communication um, campaign to make sure that you actually get people to have confidence and enroll the, in the system. If we look at Indonesia, Indonesia is one of the best examples of an NHI that has increased coverage of the population to almost 83% of the population over five years and reduced out-of-pocket expenditure very significantly from about 53% to 32%. Um, the Indonesian system is very sophisticated from a technology perspective, and um, it uses a lot of modern um, technology like an app um, and electronic claiming. But again, in a very successful system, when we look at it, there are key lessons for South Africa, because even the Indonesian system, which is known as the JKN program, um, funding is a big issue. Quality of care is a big issue. Fraud is a big issue. A lot of doctors don't want to join the NHI um, because of the tariff that they're being paid. The information system is not being effectively implemented. So patients can't process their claims, et cetera. So that is, there's lots of lessons for us to look at from an Indonesian perspective. And then finally, I've, I've mentioned that I'm doing work for the World Bank in, and the IFC in Egypt. In Egypt, um, They've been very clear on how they roll out their benefit package, but they've had very poor levels of response from the private sector. Um, people are not registering with it. They don't believe in it. There's a lack of trust. So we've got to have very strong leadership for South Africa. We've got to engage and listen to different stakeholders. And we've got to have a robust transparency fin financing plan because it's impossible to roll out an NHI that's essentially tax funded when nobody knows what we are actually getting. And then lastly, it's very important to engage with healthcare workers and get their buy-in because without the buy-in of the healthcare workers, it's the same as having a cell phone without a network. So I'll pause there, but there are many, many different examples. And I definitely don't think we need to reinvent the wheel and start from scratch because there are countries around the world that clearly show what works and what doesn't work. And there are some very, very clear lessons for South Africa. If I can sum them up, in my view, I think that um, we need to be very clear that we want to improve healthcare access for our people, but we've got to hold um, uh, the powers to account. And that means we've got to make sure that we've got good governance and we curb corruption. Uh, we've got to work in a step-by-step -step manner. So we've got to expand coverage in a systematic phased approach. Um, we've got to minimize the amount of money that people spend. In some NHIs in the world, like we saw in some of the um, South American countries, people actually end up spending more out of pocket when an NHI is implemented. So we've got to make sure we don't repeat those um, mistakes. We've got to have data-driven decisions. We've got a lot of data, a lot of healthy information in the country. In fact, some of the best on the continent. We need to start using data to make decisions. Um, the fund that runs the NHI must be operationally sound, and the funding has to be sustainable. We need to start with primary health care, and we need to tackle our workforce challenges and invest in improving the, the quality of working conditions for healthcare workers. And we need to really foster better coordination and engagement amongst different stakeholders. So I'd like to pause there and really thank you for the opportunity. And hopefully next time we can engage face to face. Thank you very much. Well, a round of applause for Dr. Kavadia. I think very, very practical suggestions. And I think the one thing I take away from there is hambagashle. 
with this thing. <laughs> Don't just jump into it, you know, government jumping into it. They've been talking about it for six or eight years now. But uh, it's just now, just before 2024 elections, that they want to uh, put more, uh, put their foot on the pedal. So I think what we've learned, uh, our researchers and colleagues, is the importance of public-private partnerships in all of this here. Uh, we've learned from Ghana, the professional management, because one member of the ruling party, when she spoke in the debate, uh, and, and Davizita, you were not there. I think Deputy Chief Whip, you were there. And they said, oh, look at Ghana, what a wonderful example Ghana is. Yeah, it can maybe be a good example, but do we follow the example? Or will we follow that example? And then the, the question of the trust deficit and consultation. So thank you very, very much, uh, Dr. Kavadia, for uh, giving us your time and uh, very, that insightful presentation. We will keep in touch with you uh, if we need to have more information. So thank you very, very much. Uh, thank you, everyone. Good thank afternoon, you. everybody. Thank you. Colleagues, NHI is going to take care of your health. Now it's going to be the IFP taking care of your health. From 2 o'clock to 3 o'clock, lunch is being served at uh, the same place. Uh, let the leaders please proceed. And when we come back uh, after 3, uh, we are going to have a, a political session. We'll be addressed by the president. So be back at 3 o'clock. He'll take us through. We'll just have a bit of sharing of ideas some of the resolutions, and then at 5 o'clock we will uh, say goodbye to each other for today. So do enjoy your lunch, Pastor. You want to pray, or you think they've prayed enough? They've prayed enough, right. <laughs> Thank you. So see you later.